I'm Dr. Mary Strack from the University of Chicago, and along with my co-chair, Dr. Joseph Lasky from Tulane School of Medicine and the new Chief Medical Officer of the PFF, we want to welcome you to part one of a didactic and interactive session on interstitial lung disease diagnosis and therapy, essential updates for 2021. Part two will take place tomorrow afternoon. This afternoon's session is divided into four blocks with short breaks between each didactic block except for a longer mid-afternoon break at 2 p.m. The final block is a multidisciplinary discussion session. There will be a live question and answer session after each block, so please submit your questions during the lectures. We will start what's going to be a highly educational session with an update on guidelines and clinical trials. Dr. Toby Marr, Professor of Medicine at USC and Director of the ILD Program at the Keck School of Medicine, will speak on diagnostic guidelines, update in HP and IPF. Dr. Vikramit Kangura from Innova Advanced Lung Disease and Transplant Program will speak on therapeutic updates, inbuild, and other recently completed clinical trials. Dr. Kangura will not be available for today's question and answer session. So let's listen to the first talk. Hi everyone, my name is Toby Ma. I'm Director of Interstitial Lung Disease at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you today about diagnostic guidelines and giving an update on hypersensitivity pneumonitis and idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. These are my declarations of interest. Um, so the, the history of defining different forms of fibrosing lung disease goes back to the turn of the last or the turn of this century. Um, prior to the year 2000, we didn't have any clinical guidelines, and instead we tended to lump together lots of different fibrotic lung diseases. But over the course of the 1980s and 1990s, it became increasingly clear that there were different histological lesions making up pulmonary fibrosis, and with the advent of CT scanning, it became clear that these different histological lesions had different radiographic appearances, and importantly, had different survivals. And really, that was what underpinned the development of clinical guidelines for defining uh, the different interstitial lung diseases. And I'm not going to go into this in detail. I'm sure all of you have seen this schematic before now. But this is really our current classification scheme for the different forms of interstitial lung disease. Uh, another important development of the guidelines, just to touch on briefly, was the concept of the multidisciplinary team meeting, which was to say that it's been accepted that the gold standard way of diagnosing ILD is through the integration of clinical history, uh, radiological appearance, uh, and pathological appearance where necessary, and that the best way to achieve this integration is to bring together clinicians, radiologists, and pathologists uh, into a single diagnostic meeting. Now, I've been asked to touch on idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and all of you will recognize this as the most rapidly progressive of the fibrosing lung diseases that we see in clinical practice. After that 2001 set of guidelines, we've seen a 2011 update, uh, and more recently, a 2018 update, uh, and we can anticipate an update on this one in the near future. We've also seen guidance from other groups, and the Fleischner Society is, is a radiological society that focuses on producing radiological guidelines, and they too uh, have produced guidance on how to interpret uh, radiological appearances in patients with suspected idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. But if we take the current guideline criteria, we recognize that to diagnose IPF uh, requires the exclusion of interstitial lung diseases of known cause. Uh, it then requires the presence on CT scan uh, of the pattern associated with usual interstitial pneumonia. And where it's not possible to make diagnosis from clinical history and CT alone, we then integrate uh, pathological findings as well. So I, I'm just going to race through. Uh, the key features uh, that we consider based on the guidelines. Uh, 
So when it comes to the radiology, we've divided it up into those appearances that are definitely associated with UIP, those that are probably associated, those that are indeterminate, and then on the far uh, right-hand side there, appearances that suggest an alternative diagnosis. And what we're looking for on a CT scan to make a definitive diagnosis or, or to definitively identify uh, the lesion of UIP is that we're looking for bilateral, subplural, predominantly basal honeycombing and reticular change. When we see that, as we do in this CT scan that I'm demonstrating on the screen, we can be confident that the patient has usual interstitial pneumonia. And in the correct clinical context, that allows us to make a diagnosis of IPF. Just to go through this again, we're looking for subplural basal honeycombing. When we have all of that, the diagnosis is relatively straightforward. There are other clues we can look for, such as this propeller blade uh, craniocordial distribution, which I'll show you an example of in a second, and an absence of atypical features, such as mosaic attenuation uh, or consolidation. And just to illustrate this propeller, propeller blade appearance, what we're looking at is that in the apices, the fibrosis tends to be anterior. At the bases, it tends to swing round to be posterior. And if you imagine the propeller on a plane, it turns in that way such that it moves from anterior to posterior. When the CT appearance is less typical, we need to move on to histology to help provide us a diagnosis. Uh, and as with the radiological appearance, we divide up the histological patterns into those that are definite for UIP, those that are probable, those that are possible, uh, and those that are unrelated to UIP. And the key features that we're looking for uh, is evidence of fibrosis. Uh, it tends to be patchy. So there can be areas of normal lung interspersed by fibrotic lung. It tends to be predominantly subplural, and there tends to be the presence of fibroblastic foci, which are the centers where uh, the fibrosis appears to arise from. Uh, and this just gives you an example of the patchy nature of, of uh, UIP at low power. And here at high power, we can see these fibroblastic foci that really tell us that this is the histological lesion of UIP. And so the guidelines provide this table for trying to integrate the histopathological and HRCT appearances. Uh, and you can see, depending on the combination of appearances, uh, we can make diagnoses of increasing confidence. Uh, alternatively, when the CT scan doesn't look like UIP or the histology doesn't look like UIP, we should be looking for alternate diagnoses. The one thing to bear in mind and what doesn't come across clearly in all of the tables in the guidelines is that not all UIP is IPF. We can have the typical CT and histological appearances. And of course, in the majority of occasions, this is going to be IPF. But there are a range of other disorders associated with the UIP pattern. And so it is important that we integrate the clinical history uh, with both the radiological and pathological patterns. And so just to try and put this in context, and if you read the guidelines in detail, this comes out in the text. But essentially, there are features that strongly suggest the diagnosis of IPF on the clinical history, older age, male gender, former cigarette smoking, family history of fibrotic lung disease, uh, a lifetime of potential exposures, finger clubbing, uh, and uh, bilateral basal crepitations on auscultation. Uh, there are things that might be considered of intermediate likelihood, so slightly younger age, uh, being female in gender, having a, a distant exposure history, perhaps having kept uh, birds in the distant past. And then there are things in the clinical history that make it unlikely to be IPF. So current exposure to a known antigen that causes hypersensitivity pneumonitis, a pneumotoxic drug, age less than 45, rheumatological symptoms or signs, uh, or squeaks or squawks on auscultation.
And so really the take home from all of this is that to make a diagnosis of IPF requires integration of the clinical history and CT. Usually we'll perform a mini MDT at this point once we've got the CT scan. And if we can make a confident diagnosis, then we can make a treatment decision. If after clinical history and integration of CT, we can't make a confident diagnosis, then we're going to move on to more invasive investigations such as biopsy. Again, we're going to have an MDT. Uh, and again, hopefully that will give us a confident diagnosis. However, it's worth remembering from the current guidelines that about 15% of patients fall into the unclassifiable bracket. And in those patients, we have to make a working diagnosis Sometimes that will be of IPF, sometimes it will be of other diseases. We will treat accordingly, but in this patient group, it is important that we undertake regular diagnostic review. The next guidelines I'm going to cover are those relating to the diagnosis of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So these were very recently published in the last 12 months. As you'll all know, hypersensitivity pneumonitis is an immune-mediated disease. Uh, where the inflammatory cells within the lung react to inhaled antigen, most commonly uh, from mold or fungal spores uh, or from bird uh, uh, exposure. That can lead on to two forms of the disease, the acute form that is characterized by widespread granulomas inflammation uh, or the chronic form where we see the development of fibrosis and scarring. It's worth saying that the guidelines have moved away from the old language of acute, subacute, and chronic, uh, and have moved to the language of non-fibrotic and fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And that really was because the subacute group caused a lot of confusion uh, as to the nature of the disease and optimal therapy. How should we diagnose suspected hypersensitivity pneumonitis? Well, of course, history is important. We're looking for an active exposure. Uh, and there are a number of good review articles that cover potential exposures in great detail. Uh, there are a number of these that can be both domestic uh, or occupational. Uh, and it is important that one explores these in detail in the clinical history, particularly where one suspects hypersensitivity pneumonitis. It's worth saying, however, that even after a detailed history, approximately two thirds of patients will lack a clear cut exposure. Then there's the clinical examination where often we will hear squawks on auscultation. This reflects really the small airway obstruction that occurs with the inflammatory bronchiolitis uh, that we tend to see occurring in hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Next comes the imaging and we're looking for a number of things. In acute disease, we're looking for central lobular nodules, often associated with ground glass attenuation and evidence of gas trapping, so-called mosaic attenuation. In the fibrotic form, we're looking for evidence of fibrosis, so traction bronchiectasis, reticulation, loss of volume. But at the same time, we're also looking at the pattern of distribution, so we expect it to be bronchocentric, and we often see this small airway involvement giving rise to mosaic attenuation. So just to reiterate that, we're looking for mosaic attenuation, which is lobules of decreased attenuation. We're looking for a pattern of distribution of fibrosis that's diff different to IPF. So we're looking particularly for bronchocentric fibrosis, more often occurring in the upper lobes. Uh, and we're also looking for coexistent changes that, that we can sometimes see in hypersensitivity pneumonitis, such as central lobular nodules. So here with the arrows, we can see the lobules of decreased attenuation. Uh, in this one, we can see that the fibrosis is following the airway. So this is airway-centered fibrosis. And in cross-section, we can see that the fibrosis here clusters around the airways. Uh, however, we also recognize that in chronic fibrotic disease, there is an overlap in appearance with UIP and IPF. We can sometimes see um, UIP-like changes in hypersensitivity pneumonitis, and you can see that reflected on this uh, section in the lower lobes here where we now have subpleural honeycomb change. So just going back to what we're looking for, um, other things that we might look for are serum precipitins on blood testing. 
Uh, we might look for the positivity of certain specific circulating antibodies. We can also think about doing bronchoscopy where we're looking for evidence of lymphocytic inflammation. Uh, and the reason we do that is twofold. Lymphocytic uh, alveolitis helps support a diagnosis of hypersensitivity pneumonitis. But importantly, it also seems to identify patients who are most likely to respond to therapy. And then after we've done that, um, if we still haven't made a diagnosis, we're going to consider doing biopsy. And in biopsy, what we're looking for are airway-centered granulomatous inflammation. We're also looking for chronic cellular bronchiolitis, and that tends to be uh, lymphocytic and sometimes eosinophilic in nature. And also within the alveoli, uh, we will see a chronic inflammatory cell infiltrate. And this here just uh, gives an overall impression of a patient with fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. We can see a patchy UIP-like appearance. However, at higher power, we can see an inflammatory cell infiltrate. We can see that fibrosis is frequently centered around airways. Uh, and when we go in at high power magnification, we can see these loosely formed uh, granulometer and often there are hyaline membranes that go with these. And so this table is taken from the guidelines, and this just speaks to how we try and integrate the clinical history with the CT scan, and then with other features uh, in the assessment of our pa patients, including the, the bowel lymphocytosis uh, and the histological appearances. And again, this helps us uh, develop a level of confidence for the diagnosis in patients with suspected hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Uh, so that really is a whistle-stop tour of the current guidance on IPF and chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Of course, much more detail is available uh, in the guideline documents themselves, but hopefully this has given you a flavor of how we now approach uh, the diagnostic assessment of both IPF and hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So thank you very much for listening to me. Hi, how are you? I'm Vikram Jeet Kangora. I'm a pulmonary and critical care physician at Adobe Fairfax Hospital. I work um, as faculty in the advanced lung disease and transplant department. Uh, today, as part of the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation lectures, I'm going to be discussing recent trials in pulmonary fibrosis. So a quick overview. Um, we'll review the diagnosis and approach to progressive fibrosing interstitial lung disease. We'll review three recent trials in the treatment of PFILD. We'll review a recent trial on uh, pulmonary hypertension treatment in patients with pulmonary fibrosis as well as other lung diseases. And then uh, summarize the recommendations based on this new data. So progressive fibrosing ILDs really encompass a number of different interstitial lung diseases. I think classically, we think about uh, IPF or idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis as the big chunk of that, but it encompasses patients with idiopathic NSIP, um, patients with connective tissue disorder ILDs, those with genetic or familial pulmonary fibrosis, unclassifiable ILDs, drug-induced, as well as a number of others, including chronic HP, sarcoidosis, and those that we otherwise can't identify. <clears throat> so unfortunately at this time, there's really no agreed upon consensus definition of pulmonary progressive fibrosing ILD. Um, I think based off of the recent trial, the INVIL trial that we'll discuss um, and the success there, there's a proposed diagnostic criteria based on that study, which includes one of the following. So a relative decline in FEC greater than or equal to 10% of predicted, a relative decline of FEC greater than or equal to five to 10% of predicted, along with progression of fibrosis as seen on a high-res CT. Uh, again, a decline in FEC greater than or equal to 5 to 10% are predicted with worsening respiratory symptoms, patients becoming more dysmic, increased cough. And then a combination of res worsening respiratory symptoms as well as increased fibrotic progression on HRCT. So meeting one of these criteria over the course of the last 24 months, is one of the proposed diagnostic criteria for PFLD, but as I mentioned, no current agreed upon definition. <clears throat> so here's an example. Um, on the left side of your screen, the uh, top left and top, uh, bottom left um, images, 
that's a patient with rheumatoid arthritis ILD who's placed on immunosuppression. And so adequate immunosuppression is given to this patient, but over the course of six months, as you can see, as we look to the right side of your, your screen, uh, that patient has developed significant fibrotic progression of their disease. So this is a good example of a patient with connective tissue disorder ILD that's demonstrated that despite adequate immunosuppression has had progressive fibrosing lung disease. Uh, Dr. Cotton published a nice article in 2019 on PFILD with this, uh, with this algorithm on sort of how to approach, approach it. Um, you know, I think it's our standard approach to identifying an ILD, which includes a multidisciplinary dis discussion. And then once you've identified what box your ILD falls into, maybe it's unclassifiable, maybe it's a CT ILD, maybe it's IPF, you determine whether or not you need to watch and wait or treat. <clears throat> And so let's take our previous example of a patient with RILD. They were diagnosed, they were then treated with immunosuppression, and then we monitor their disease progression. And we assess to see whether or not they have worsening symptoms, whether or not they have fibrotic progression on the CT, whether or not their PFTs and their FBC worsen. And at that point, we really determine whether or not they've had disease progression or potentially fibrotic progression, which would then classify them as PFILD. So the IMBIL trial, uh, which is a landmark study from 2019 published in the New England Journal of Medicine, looked to evaluate using nintenanib in patients with PFILD. We know previously that nintenanib um, works for patients with IPF, but didn't have any good randomized control data on whether or not it worked for PFILD uh, otherwise. So uh, they did a 52-week study with um, over 300 patients and the treatment and the placebo group um, and evaluated the FEC decline over that time. And as, I, as you can see on the, on the graph there, um, there was a pretty impressive uh, difference in patients who were treated with an intentative versus those that weren't. And so there was a statistically significant difference in FEC decline over the course of 52 weeks with a difference of about 107 milliliters. Uh, no difference in quality of life or survival was seen. Notably, it was effective in both patients with UIP-like disease and those with non-UIP-like fibrotic pattern on their CT. Diarrhea, by far the most common side effect happening in 60 to 70% of patients, um, but also happening in about 24% of placebo. Profenadone, which is our other medication approved for the treatment of IPF, was also studied in this context uh, in the relief study, uh, which was published earlier this year. It was also a multi-centered double-blinded RCT, uh, which evaluated patients with non-IPF fibrotic lung disease, included CTD ILD, fibrotic idiopathic NSIP, fibrotic HP, as well as asbestosis. Unfortunately, due to slow recruitment, the study was uh, terminated prematurely. So they only had 127 patients in this study. Um, you know, it did reduce the rate of FEC decline over 48 weeks when they used, uh, when they did the statistical analysis on the imputed data that they did have available. And uh, that difference was about three and a half percent of FEC predicted. There was no difference seen in DLCO, six minute walk distance or quality of life. Again, unfortunately, not a robust study um, as the inbuild was. Um, I think a lot of us theoretically would presume that profenadone should also work in these patients, but we just don't have large good trial data to support that. <clears throat> and then uh, previously in 2020, profenadone was also evaluated for unclassifiable PFILD. This is also a double blind RCT. Uh, a larger study with 253 patients. The primary endpoint was also a mean predicted change in FPC over the course of 24 weeks. Uh, interestingly, they used home spirometry for this study. And so, uh, you know, when they did the pre-specified analysis for, for the primary endpoint, um, they really couldn't perform it due to high variability of the home spirometry readings. Um, so I think the real downfall here was that, you know, they, they depended on home spirometry, um, which, which led to unreliable readings and thus the, the study didn't hit its primary endpoint. Um, as part of their secondary endpoints, they did look at um, in-office spirometry for patients that had that data. And it actually, in patients who had in-office spirometry, there was a statistically significant difference in the rate of FEC decline over 24 weeks. As you can see about 95 milliliters there. So I think uh, you know if we can do get a well-designed profenadone trial uh, that completes all the way through, we may actually see a signal there for profenadone, the use of either unclassifiable PFILD 
or PFILD um, otherwise. And then earlier this year, uh, uh, really um, another landmark study um, published by Dr. Waxman um, and, and those in the INCREASE trial here, which looked at the treatment of pulmonary hypertension in patients who have interstitial lung disease, you know, and that includes patients with pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, up to this point, we've had no drugs that have had a large RCT data to support their use uh, in patients who have pulmonary hypertension and um, interstitial lung disease. So this, this trial was, was landmark. Uh, it was a multi-center placebo-controlled trial, double-blinded. Uh, it looked at patients with group three pulmonary hypertension, so those with lung disease. Uh, trial with 326 patients, 163 patients divided between the treatment and placebo groups. The primary endpoint was the difference between the two groups um, and the change in peak six-minute walk distance from baseline to week 16. And then the secondary endpoints included BMP level changes as well as time to clinical worsening. So um, it did hit its primary endpoint. So Tyvezo or inhaled troprostanil improved six minute walk distance in those that were treated by 31 meters compared to placebo. Um, and the secondary endpoints were also significant. So there was a 42% reduction in BMP in those treated with inhaled troprostanil. There was a 39% reduction in clinical worsening events in those treated with in, uh, inhaled troprostanil. And those that got treatment actually had fewer um, exacerbations of their underlying lung disease. Uh, commonly, we saw patients experience cough, headache, dyspnea, dizziness. Some had nausea, fatigue, and diarrhea, although um, less frequent than the others. Um, and then throat irritation and oropharyngeal pain were really the only statistically significant adverse events compared to placebo. So in summary, um, an antenanib, or otherwise known as OFEV, really should be started in patients with evidence of PFILD. We have good data based off the inbuilt study that supports its use. So in patients who qualify uh, for having PFILD that can tolerate the medication, you really should consider starting those patients. Profenadone may also slow progression of disease. However, unfortunately, unfortunately not currently FDA approved and the current trials are flawed. I, I'm hopeful that we will see some, some additional data in the near future um, in regards to profenadone and PFILD. Uh, side effects are quite common with Nintendo abuse, diarrhea being the most common. Um, and, you know, as we discussed early, there is unfortunately no agreed upon consensus definition of PFLD. However, given approval of, of OFAD for the treatment of PFLD, we have personally adopted the criteria per the inbuilt study, uh, but we'll wait to see uh, what, the, what the guidelines eventually recommend here. Uh, and then I think the most recent uh, um, really, really exciting development is that Tyvezo or inhaled troprostanil is approved for the use of patients that have pulmonary hypertension and group, uh, group, three, group three pulmonary hypertension with, um, with interstitial lung disease. And so really in those patients, um, we should consider treating those patients with inhaled troprostanil and certainly screening them. Thank you. I want to thank both of our speakers for their outstanding and really informative presentations. We'll now have a live question and answer session, so please submit uh, any questions you might have. It's a great opportunity to um, ask um, our experts uh, how they practice and how they make use of the guidelines in clinical practice. Um, while we're waiting for questions to uh, come in, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Maher if he um, can tell us how he makes use of the clinical practice guidelines. And in fact, if you don't have a multidisciplinary uh, meeting, can you still use the guidelines and how might you do so? Uh, yeah, thanks for that question, Mary. Um, you know, I, I think the, the guidelines provide a useful format to help us think about how we frame diagnosis for our patients. Um, you know, uh, diagnosis of fibrotic ILD in particular is often challenging. Um, the guidelines speak to that challenge by including a, a category of unclassifiable ILD. So I think we, we recognize up front that they're imperfect, but they do provide a framework for helping us um, both formulate a, a sort of assessment of how we think patients' disease is going to behave over time so we can make 
prognostic inferences from the different diagnostic categories. Uh, and they do also provide important guidance as to how we might think about treating patients up front. So, you know, I, I think ultimately the, the guidelines provide an important framework. And, and although we talk about MDT, the simplest form of MDT is really going to talk to your radiologist. Um, you know, in, in, in 70 to 80% of cases, we can make the diagnosis based on clinical history and radiological appearance. Um, and although we've created this concept that an MDT is lots of people sitting in a room, actually going and talking to your radiologist, discussing the CT appearance is, is actually um, a, a form of, of integrating both yours and the radiologist's opinion. And, and you know, in, in oftentimes that, that's enough to, to make a diagnosis, particularly when the, the, the radiographic appearance is a clear cut. And if you've got a, a definite UIP pattern on CT scan, then often... Um, the, the process is very simple and, and really the, the detailed discussion more often goes into those patients with atypical appearances. So I, I think, you, you know, it, the, the important concept from MDT is talking to our fellow colleagues um, in person and not just relying on written reports. So we don't need to work in academic centres to apply the guidelines, really. Yeah, I, I would second that. And in fact, before we started, I've been in practice a really long time before we, so before we started doing uh, MDTs, we would go and meet with chest radiology. And the other benefit of that is the chest radiologists learn a lot. And so at your institution, maybe they aren't experts in ILD, but if you meet with them uh, in person when they're reading films, uh, they're gonna actually learn a lot from you as well. I, and I would certainly agree with that. And I, I think, you know, having spent a lot of my career at the Brompton uh, with David Hansel, who was considered one of the sort of great radiologists in ILD, and he learned a lot of his, a lot of the value he added came from the fact that he had received clinical feedback on cases. And so it really is a two-way street. If, if you and the radiologist practice in complete isolation and they never get any feedback on the CT scans, then they never know to iterate their advice in the future. And so I, I think that that, that two-way component of the discussion is really important because we can learn from the radiologist, but they can also learn from us. Joe, do you have anything you wanna add before we move on to some of the other questions? Well, well let's tackle the other questions first and then, and then I have some, some questions as well. So there's a question uh, regarding the MDD or um, so multidisciplinary evaluation. How are you looking at the patients that look like they have IPF but have low level serology? So positive ANA or rheumatoid factor, negative rheumatologist evaluation. What do we do with those patients? I, I think that's a that's a very difficult question to which I'm not convinced I truly know the answer. But, um, you know, this problem has been encapsulated in the concept of IPATH, so interstitial pneumonia with autoimmune features. Um, and there are several documents sort of written describing uh, how we might consider these patients who appear to have uh, an idiopathic fibrotic lung disease, but who also have some features suggestive of autoimmunity. Um, you know, that although clinically they feel like these patients might have an autoimmune component to their disease, the research that has been done so far suggests that their outcome is very similar to patients with IPF without positive serology. Um, we, when we did the unclassifiable ILD study with perfenidone, we tried to look at this subgroup of patients and see whether they benefited both from antifibrotic and immunosuppressant therapy. And what was actually interesting in the, the post hoc analyses we did was that actually patients who fitted this IPAF classification benefited from antifibrotic treatment with perfenidone. But those patients who were given mycophenolate as well actually seem to have worse outcomes. Mm -hmm. And so my, my gut feeling is probably we should just treat these patients as IPF. We should give them antifibrotics. My concern is that although intuitively we want to give them immunosuppression, that actually, like we've seen in IPF with the Panther study, that immunosuppression may be harmful in these patients. So I, I think we should be treating them as IPF, 
but certainly where possible, we should be doing the academic studies to try and better understand whether immunosuppression is, is valuable in this patient group or not. Yeah, I agree with that. And I, I think histopathology, and by that, I mean uh, often the pattern on CT um, is uh, it really important. So when you have a UIP pattern, um, you likely are dealing with a lot of fibrosis that isn't gonna be responsive to immunosuppressive therapy. Follow-up question, with the use of Cellcept and OFEV or Esbriate, do you discontinue or lower when BUN creatinine are elevated? I have to say I don't. Um, you know, both OFEV and Esbriot come with, with um, warnings in their label about starting them in patients with end-stage renal failure or more advanced renal failure. Um, however, in, in clinical practice, I've not encountered any problems using either drug uh, in patients with uh, even sort of relatively um, uh, sort of advanced renal disease. So personally, I wouldn't stop treatment in those patients. Uh, I would just monitor carefully, particularly liver function to make sure that there's no knock on side effects. Joe, what's your practice? It, it would be very similar to what uh, Dr. Mahler said. Uh, can, can you expand on the role of BAL in diagnosis and more importantly, treatment decisions and treatment response? Do you perform BAL on all your patients without a clear exposure or if the radiograph is only compatible with HP? Um, so in general, I only perform BAL if um, hypersensitivity pneumonitis or, well, so assuming we're talking about patients with fibrotic ILD, we'll sort of forget things like sarcoid and uh, other rarer ILDs, but if we've got a patient with fibrotic ILD, I'll only do the, the lavage if, if hypersensitivity pneumonitis falls into the differential diagnosis, either because of an exposure history uh, or because there are radi radiological features to suggest that HP might be a diagnosis. Um, and then when I do the, the, uh, the BAL, what I'm looking for is a lymphocytosis um, both to support a diagnosis of HP, but also to help guide treatment. <clears throat> um, in work that we've done, and, and in fact, studies that other groups have published, what we've tended to find is that a 20% threshold of lymphocytes does seem to predict patients with a better prognosis. So lymphocytes above 20% seem to predict patients who do better with treatment, uh, and by that I mean sort of corticosteroids or immunosuppressants, uh, a lymphocyte count below 20% seems to pick out a patient group who behave like IPF, even if they've got features that suggest the diagnosis of HP. So I, I, I sort of use that threshold to both guide making a diagnosis, but also uh, to drive treatment decisions. And can you reiterate which patients would you be doing the BAL in? And then when would you add transbronchial or cryobiopsy? Um, so it, it, the, the patients I would choose is anyone with CT features that suggest HP. So if there's mosaic attenuation, you know, if there's an upper lobe predominance, th th those sort of things that would, or if there's a sense of bronchocentricity, that would push me to do it or even if they had a sort of definite or probable UIP appearance, if they had an exposure history, then I would also do the bronchoscopy in those patients. Um, the, the cryobiopsy is certainly something that we've been increasingly doing. Uh, again, I would, it, it, it sort of comes down to fitness. Um, you know, I think we can safely do bronchoalveolar lavage in the vast majority of our patients. I think with cryobiopsy, one needs to make a further assessment of an individual's fitness to undergo that. So certainly in older patients, uh, patients with significant lung function impairment, frailer patients, uh, I would rely just on the lavage alone. Younger patients, those with earlier disease and well-preserved lung function, uh, I would uh, obtain a cryobiopsy at the same time and, and sort of integrate the information from the two modalities. I would like to make a comment that if I were to do a lavage on somebody who I thought had fibrotic HP and I didn't have elevated lymphocyte counts, that wouldn't dissuade me from making that diagnosis in the end. 
uh, with the MDD. In other words, sometimes you don't see that lymphocytosis in fibrotic HP. Would it, I, I, uh, sorry. Would it change how you treat though? Would you be less likely to give prednisone or immunosuppression in that case? Yeah, I would agree with the comments that Dr. Maher said earlier, if, if the lymphocytes were high, then you might be more likely to do so with the immunosuppressants. Yeah, so I would, I would agree with you, Joe. I, I think a lymphocyte count less than 20 doesn't preclude the diagnosis, but it certainly makes me much more pessimistic about the benefits of treatment with corticosteroids and Cellcept or other immunosuppressants. Okay, we have uh, one interesting question in only about a minute and a half. Um, I'll hopefully let each of you have a shot at, given the Tyveso data, are you regularly performing annual screening echo now in ILD patients? So how has that changed your practice? Um, so my short answer is yes. Uh, so if, and if we go back a decade when we had all the trials with the endothelial antagonists, I used to do annual echoes on my patients because I thought it was valuable to identify pH. Then when we had all the negative trials, I stopped doing it because I didn't really think it added value. And I would only do echo if, if patients had symptoms suggestive of pH and I wanted to define it better. But I think now that we have a treatment option for our patients where, you know, we see improvements in quality of life and walk distance, I, I think identifying pH is now important again. So I've certainly moved back to actively screening for pH, certainly in patients who've got uh, evidence of exertional desaturation, patients who've got a DLCO below 40%, patients who've got an elevated BNP, uh, I will actively look for pH now. Dr. Lasky, do you want to comment? And, and also, would you be doing right heart calves in those patients eventually? So um, yes, I'm doing right heart casts on those patients uh, to document that they do have the pulmonary hypertension and don't have wedges, which are greater than uh, 16. Um, in addition to that, I, I'd say, yes, you know, I'm doing them much more frequently now the echoes than in the past. I certainly don't do it on everyone. If somebody with mild disease, um, you know, with a relatively well-preserved diffusing capacity, not on oxygen, uh, I wouldn't begin at that time. But uh, the, the uh, subset at risk that Dr. Maher described, certainly. So we now have uh, some really interesting questions uh, in addition to the great questions we've already had that have come in, but not enough time to tackle them. But some of the topics we'll be revisiting later in the afternoon. So please um, resubmit your questions at that time. I uh, wanna thank uh, Dr. Barr and um, our um, speakers for their excellent presentations and uh, Dr. Lasky and I'll be back after a short, uh, I think, a 10 minute break um, to start the second block of lectures. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Deborah Gleason. I am a nurse practitioner in the Interstitial Lung Disease Clinic at the University of Kentucky in Lexington, Kentucky. Today, I'd like to speak to you about integrating palliative care in your clinical practice, and also a little bit about symptom management in your interstitial lung disease patients. First, let me take a few minutes to describe what palliative care is. Some of you may be familiar with palliative care, but to palliate means to make less severe or intense. So really with our interstitial lung disease patients, we are providing palliative care almost all the time because we are working towards lessening the severity of the symptoms of the disease out curing or removing the underlying cause. And this would be palliative care that we provide to our patients. What does palliative care do? It improves the quality of our patients' lives by managing those symptoms and allowing them to have the highest degree of functioning as possible. It also manages emotional symptoms along with those physical symptoms. Support, giving caregivers the necessary tools to take care of these patients. It's also establishing goals of care. What would these patients like to do in a situation where they're unable to make decisions on their own, which also assists with advanced care planning? 
it's really imperative that we talk to our patients with interstitial lung disease about what to plan for the future. What types of hospitalizations would they like? What types of medical cares? So that we're having a clear plan for the future and not necessarily reacting to crisis. You would be surprised, the literature does show that most people do not get the opportunity to do advanced care planning and really wish that they had. Caregivers will tell you that they wish they had known more about the disease and about what to expect. So it's really important for us dealing with interstitial lung diseases and the terminal nature of these diseases to be able to help establish those goals of care and assist with advanced care planning. So how can you as a provider put integrated, integrate palliative care into your practice? Well, the first thing is if you have access to palliative care in your community, in your inpatient, your outpatient clinics, it's really important that you hook those patients up with that service. The first thing you need to explain to them is palliative care is not hospice. Palliative care is providing that extra lay of support to an individual in any uh, stage of their disease process. We hope that that is at the beginning of their stage, but not necessarily sometimes people are referred to palliative care way too late. So if you have a local community uh, hospice and palliative care agency, if you are near a medical center that has an inpatient palliative care team, or if you have a clinic that provides palliative care either in your own specialty clinic or freestanding, really it's important to hook up your patients with those services early so that they can help them and support them uh, through their journey. Include a palliative care provider in your multidisciplinary team meetings. Um, we have our interdisciplinary team meetings a couple of times a month, which includes our radiologists, our pathologists, our doctors, our rheumatologists, our whole panel of specialty physicians. And so it just makes sense to include that specialty of palliative care in those multidisciplinary meetings. It provides uh, some input in terms of what palliative care can provide for the patient and some expertise on symptom management. Also utilize your support staff. If you are fortunate enough to have a clinic uh, or a, an agency that provides you with some support staff, whether that's a nurse um, or a nurse practitioner or a medical tech um, or some administrative help, sometimes you can utilize those individuals to call patients routinely and to keep up the communication. Because one of the things that we do find with our um, interstitial lung disease patients is that they do require an extra layer of support to be able to prevent those hospitalizations because we're dealing with so many symptoms and probably most of the time, a lot of comorbidities. So if you have uh, somebody that can make routine phone calls, we're fortunate enough to be able to have a full-time pharmacist in our clinic. And so we uh, allow him to call patients, monitor them on their antifibrotics or their uh, steroid treatments or even uh, tobacco cessation. So uh, we're fortunate to utilize our support staff to be able to continue to communicate with those patients. What can you do as a provider to educate yourself? Really look towards those resources that are out there on the internet that can give you the background in what palliative care is and how you might be able to provide it yourself if you don't have access to the specialty services. Uh, Center for to Advanced uh, Palliative Care, CAPSI, is a great resource. They have all kinds of educational programs that you can access. Some are free, some require a membership. Um, but they do everything from pain and symptom management to how to develop a palliative care program. Uh, association websites like the American Lung Association and the American Cancer Association, they also have areas of their website that talk about palliative care and how providers can hook up their patients with palliative care and what that means and how to introduce palliative care to your patient. And then some provider and patient resources. Uh, Get Palliative Care is a great website to point your patients to. It kind of explains them in a very non-threatening fashion what palliative care is and how they can benefit from it. And then, of course, always our uh, Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation is a great resource to help patients with uh, what palliative care and uh, how they can access those resources. <laughs> 
Let's talk a little bit about um, non-pharmacological management of ILD. And symptom management is really what we do now uh, when we have patients with interstitial lung disease. Um, we do have some uh, non-medications that we can use to really help our patients. The first one I bullet pointed is pulmonary rehab. I can't uh, emphasize enough how much pulmonary rehab is an important part of ILD management. If you are fortunate enough to be near a facility that provides pulmonary rehab, I highly recommend that you uh, connect your patients with that. We are fortunate to be able to actually be uh, just right next door to our pulmonary rehab center. And uh, my personal experience has been that patients benefit probably from pulmonary rehab the best um, uh, symptom management tool that we can give them. Um, unfortunately, because of COVID and what has gone on with uh, group settings and um, hospital situations and finances, a lot of pulmonary rehab centers have closed. And so we don't have the accessibility that we used to with people for pulmonary rehab. But if you have the opportunity to refer somebody to it, um, please do. That's really an essential tool in symptom management for this group. Oxygen therapy, uh, it may be something that seems simple, but helping the patients really get the appropriate type of oxygen therapy, um, whether it's um, masks or lighter tanks or something that they can use so that they have, uh, they can continue their activities of, of daily living. Palliative care, as I mentioned, uh, support groups. Um, pulmonary fibrosis fibrinogen has a great uh, page in their website about support groups that are all across the country that people can hook up to. And certainly now we're doing it all virtual. So sometimes it's a little bit easier for people to meet those meetings. Care coordination, as I mentioned, um, getting your support staff and also coordinating care with other providers. A lot of these patients, as I said, have comorbidities, um, talking to the cardiologist or the rheumatologist about managing symptoms for these patients. And then utilizing your support staff, your pharmacist, your nurse, your social worker. So symptom management is really what we focus on, and uh, it's really all the work that we have to do. We're not looking, uh, we don't have that cure yet uh, so that we work with symptom management. Remember that the antipsychotics don't help with symptoms, although I have had patients in the past tell me that they feel a little bit better, um, and I have had patients say that they feel obviously a little bit worse, more fatigued. So really um, explain that up front when you're talking about antipsychotics with patients. And ask the patient what's the most bothersome symptom to them. Um, sometimes you would think it would be dyspnea, but sometimes to them it's cough or sometimes to them it's fatigue. And really start prioritizing with what is the most bothersome symptom and work on one thing at a time with them. And then support them with integrative medicine approaches that they may have. Um, acupuncture, supplements, um, Reiki, um, all kinds of things, massage therapy, chiropractic therapy, whatever helps them with their symptoms really support them. I have a patient who uses a salt room uh, every week that really has said that that has helped her with her breathing. Cough, as I said, it's usually the most bothersome symptom, but I have had patients report that their fatigue is worse than their cough. Um, we have uh, medications that we sometimes use. Uh, as we all know, cough is probably the most challenging symptom that we deal with with this patient population. So you really have to do trial and error with these medications. Uh, inhaler therapy, although we think that inhalers would not help in a restrictive lung disease, I have had patients in the past say that they get some benefits, some from an inhaler, uh, usually the one that they had been prescribed by their uh, PCP years ago, um, but they still feel that it helps. Um, nebulized uh, lidocaine or morphine, I haven't personally used um, it for cough. I have used it in the past for uh, dyspnea, more at the end stage of uh, the disease process. And also remember to assess your patients for um, things like post-nasal drip, uh, reflux, uh, ACE therapy, any kinds of infections. Is the cough also uh, superimposed? Um, is there something that is causing the cough to be worse? Dyspnea is another uh, symptom that we deal with, obviously, all the time along with cough um, that is usually most bothersome to patients. 
really the oxygen therapy, you would think that it would be a small thing, but making sure that the patient gets the right type of oxygen therapy. Purse lip breathing, they teach that in pulmonary rehab. If you don't have that, there's a lot of uh, resources on the internet how to teach patients to that. Uh, inhalers, sometimes people say that uh, uh, an ICS may help with their shortness of breath. Um, we wouldn't think um, typically that that would help, but I have experienced in the past that patients have gotten some relief from a rescue inhaler. And then uh, morphine, both orally, sublingually uh, inhaled, those tend to be therapies that we use more towards um, the end of the disease process, um, but it has helped people um, with their dyspnea that just uh, really impairs the quality of their life. And then fatigue, poor appetite, depression, and insomnia kind of all fit together. And uh, I think this is probably another big category that we struggle with in finding what we can do, um, but really be, let them be aware of what their activity tolerance is. Um, I always tell my patients that they have a dollar to spend every day. And if they spend a dollar 50, they're gonna have to pay for it for the next day. So encourage them that if they have activities to attend that they're really, um, resting up for those activities so that they have the most energy for those special things, graduations, birthdays. Uh, importance of good sleep hygiene. So that goes with, uh, do they have OSA? Are they on their CPAP? Or is it appropriate? Um, do they need follow-up? Small meals and snacks more for the poor appetite. Don't expect the patient to sit down and eat uh, three meals a day. Uh, encourage them high protein snacks, uh, supplements, Things like uh, Boost and Ensure are really a turnoff for some people. Um, other things can be found out there. Um, instant breakfasts with uh, ice cream, those kinds of shakes that you can make, smoothies. Mirtazapine is a medication um, that I've given that actually really works with um, poor appetite, depression, and insomnia. If you start a patient out at about 7.5 milligrams at bedtime, you can increase that. Um, it seems to help with a couple of those things. It either really works for patients or it really doesn't. And then finally, support groups. I can't stress enough about how it is important it is for people to really connect with other people who have the same disease process. They get a lot of support from hearing stories from other people who are going through similar things with them, especially if they're thinking about lung transplant. So it's really helpful to connect them with that support group and um, allow them to kind of share those experiences with each other. Thank you very much for listening this afternoon, and I hope this has been helpful for you. Hi, my name is Justin Oldham, and I'm going to be talking to you today about reconciling guidelines and clinical trials, how to integrate new information into clinical practice. Here are my disclosures. So the objectives of the talk are to provide an overview of clinical trial design and phases, highlight unanswered questions raised by data published after publication of uh, the diagnostic and treatment guidelines, <clears throat> and then discuss integration of clinical trial data into clinical practice. So starting off with clinical trial design and phases, when we think about clinical trial phases, there are four phases that we assess. Uh, after a drug is approved in humans, we conduct a phase one trial, which is generally a pretty small study, can be done in healthy individuals uh, to assess preliminary safety. Often in a rare disease like pulmonary fibrosis, it's done in a small number of patients with IPF or other forms of pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, here's a nice recent phase one published by the Vanderbilt group looking at valgancyclovir for IPF. Um, as I said, small number of patients here, uh, roughly about 30. Uh, and the primary table that is presented are a bunch of adverse events, just assessing whether the drug is safer than uh, placebo. Um, the conclusions of a phase one trial are first and foremost, safety and tolerance. Um, and of course, we all want an early look at whether there may be some efficacy. So this is often presented as well. Uh, and FVC change over time being the primary endpoint that's generally employed in uh, pulmonary fibrosis clinical trials. Here we see that there is a suggestion that perhaps those receiving valgancyclovir in addition to standard of care may have less loss of vital capacity over time compared to placebo. Um, but again, this is very preliminary and, and just sort of gives justification for continuing on to, to phase two. Uh, 
Uh, so what is phase two? So still assessing safety, uh, sometimes assessing dosing, uh, but more, most importantly, larger number of patients uh, starting to get more of a sense as to whether there might be um, efficacy, although the design is not engaged towards efficacy. Um, so here's a phase two trial that was published recently looking at inhaled carbon monoxide in IPF. Um, again, not a whole lot of patients, about 60 here. Um, primary table presented again is safety, uh, just looking at adverse events between those who received the intervention versus those who didn't. Uh, and again, an early look at efficacy and as opposed to our prior longitudinal plot, we're really not seeing much difference between these two groups with regard to change in vital capacity over time. Um, and so the conclusion that's drawn from a phase two trial is first and foremost, whether the drug is safe and well tolerated. Um, and you start to comment on efficacy as well. At this point, the rubber hits the road for clinical trialists and you have to decide based on the phase two data, whether the safety profile and the early suggestion of efficacy uh, is worthy of, of moving to phase three. So phase three trial uh, is very much uh, still attuned to safety, but also now is powered to look at efficacy and assess whether a drug is actually efficacious. Um, as you can see here, there's a whole lot more patients. Um, in the world of pulmonary fibrosis, which again is a rare disease, we're, we're talking usually on the order of hundreds rather than thousands. Um, and here is you know, one of the more um, important phase threes that have been done, looking at profenadone for patients with IPF, um, as opposed to our phase one and twos, we're now seeing that roughly 500 patients were enrolled in this trial. And the take home message is, is very much focused on uh, FXC. And as you can see here, Compared to placebo, those who received profenadone had lot less loss of lung function over time and had better progression-free survival. So based on phase three data, the FDA will then the, uh, review the drug. And if the drug is both safe and efficacious, we'll uh, approve the drug. And then phase four studies are done uh, looking at post-approval surveillance to see if there's any new safety signals that come about. Um, IPF has had a long history, uh, roughly 40 years probably now, 35 years of clinical trials, uh, most of which unfortunately have not panned out. Uh, the two most successful here are profenadone and entetinib, published in 2014, and then a whole lot of other studies, as you can see here, that have not worked out. Uh, most followed a, a trend shown on the panel here on the left, which was a trial of acetylcysteine compared to placebo. For patients with IPF, as you can see here, these two lines are essentially overlying uh, when looking at change in vital capacity over time, so really no efficacy. And unfortunately, there were a few trials that were uh, done that uh, took drugs that were thought to be previously potentially efficacious and turned out to be harmful in patients with IPF. So in this case, prednisone, azathioprine, and N-acetylcysteine, uh, when received in combination, had an increased risk of death or hospitalization when compared to placebo. Uh, both of these just underscore the importance of, of conducting clinical trials in, in any disease state, because something we thought anecdotally or based on smaller trials to be efficacious could actually turn out to be harmful when powered appropriately. So let's move on to highlighting some unanswered questions that are raised by data that were that came out after the publication of these diagnostic and treatment guidelines. So there's been a number of treatment and diagnostic guidelines that have come out, um, namely in IPF. Uh, we've had a handful, the most recent being in 2018 for IPF. Um, and then we also had a, a treatment statement uh, that was put out in 2015. Um, we also have had a few sta statements put out on the idiopathic interstitial pneumonias of which IPF is one, but there are a handful of others. And so we have one uh, back in 01 and then another more recent one here. Uh, more recently, we have uh, some attention being paid to hypersensitivity pneumonitis, which is an inhalational form of pulmonary fibrosis. So consensus statement published uh, just this year in the Blue Journal, and then another one published in CHEST uh, with relatively similar and overlapping guidelines. And then, while not a formal consensus statement, um, a, a nice uh, paper by uh, the Europeans was put out in Lancet Respiratory Medicine proposing some consensus uh, criteria for systemic sclerosis uh, interstitial lung disease. So when looking at the uh, 2011 uh, practice guideline that came out, um, I'm sorry, the 2015. This guideline is great because it synthesizes a whole lot of data and helps the clinician um, gauge, you know, which of these data should inform their, their decision making and their treatment of patients. Uh, but one problem with treatment guidelines is they're not updated in real time. And so 
Uh, if you look at the 2015 guideline here, uh, appropriately, you get a conditional recommendation for the use of nintenonib and perfenidone in patients with IPF. But you also see that there's a lot of strong or conditional recommendations against the use of drugs for pulmonary hypertension. And while that is appropriate based on the data for these particular drugs, uh, this guideline doesn't take into account that there was a recent trial uh, called the INCREASE trial here, which showed that there is actually now a drug that's uh, effective for pulmonary hypertension in patients with interstitial lung disease. Um, the study had about 300 patients, um, of which 20 to 30%, depending on the treatment arm, had IPF, and then a few other forms of, of ILD that you see down there, including connective tissue disease, unclassifiable, um, that sort of thing. And uh, rather than looking at change in vital capacity over time, we're now seeing that change in walk distance, which is commonly used in pulmonary hypertension studies. Uh, there was a signal uh, compared to placebo. Those who received inhaled troposinol had an improvement in their walk distance over time, suggesting that their pulmonary hypertension uh, was under better control. And so that, that is missed by the 2015 guideline because of course it came out after the guideline. Uh, similarly, the 2015 guideline gave a con conditional recommendation for the use of antacid therapy like an H2 blocker or a proton pump inhibitor. Um, that's based on studies like this, which showed uh, when you combine clinical trial cohorts and look at those who were on an antacid versus those who weren't, those who were on the antacid had a, a trend or you know, borderline significant uh, deviation from those who didn't receive antacid therapy and they had less loss of vital capacity over time. Uh, what the the consensus statement doesn't take into account, of course, is that there were a number of uh, similar studies that came out afterwards that essentially showed the opposite, which was antacid therapy had no effect on outcomes in patients. Uh, and of course, the treatment statement that we have in IPF doesn't take into account how to treat non-IPF ILDs. And that was very much answered uh, in this study called the InBuild trial, which looked at about 600 patients with various forms of ILD, including hypersensitivity pneumonitis, autoimmune ILD, unclassifiable ILD, and others. And what we see is similar to what we saw with perfenidone or an antenonib, which was, uh, of course, approved in IPF, that over time, those who receive placebo have more loss of FEC than those who receive an antenatum. And so uh, how do you take these studies that are published after a consensus statement or a diagnostic or treatment guideline and integrate them into your clinical practice? The way I approach it is that I ask whether my patient are those patients or my patient is those patients, um, namely by looking at the inclusion exclusion criteria and then by taking a look at the subgroup analyses. And then I ask whether the benefits of the intervention outweigh the risks. Um, namely by looking at the side effect profile. So uh, is my patient those patients? So first off, uh, if you have a patient with IPF whose vital capacity is 30%, well, does your patient really fit into this trial? The Impulsus trial showing that nintenonib was effective for IPF. They restricted their trial to patients with an FBC greater than 50% and a DLCO of 30 to 80%. So you have to take that into account when uh, applying the findings of this trial to your patient. Similarly, with that inbuilt trial, uh, if you have a patient with non-IPF ILD that's progressive, you have to ask whether your definition of progression is the same that was used in the trial, which was a categorical decline in FVC of 10% or a combination of 5 to 9% decline with worsening symptoms or, or worsening fibrosis on CT scan. Uh, next, in patients with SSC ILD, uh, this is a, a newer trial that was published uh, showing the tocilizumab. Uh, in patients with SSC in general, but also more specifically in those with SSC ILD, uh, resulted in less loss of FEC over time compared to placebo. Um, and so you may be inclined to take these trial findings and apply them to your patients with SSC, but what's important to know is that among the inclusion criteria here, uh, these patients were quite inflammatory. They had elevated acute phase reactants. So um, it's important to keep in mind when, when thinking about applying this to your patients. Next, uh, when we go back to the increased study, looking at inhaled troprostanil for pulmonary hypertension, um, we have to look at the subgroup analyses. So no longer looking at inclusion exclusion, but rather was there any difference in subgroups? And looking at this forest plot here, we see that those with an idiopathic interstitial pneumonia or a connective tissue disease or autoimmune ILD uh, had pretty similar findings, uh, which supported inhaled troprostanil over placebo. But if you had a patient with combined pulmonary fibrosis and emphysema, uh, that benefit goes away. And so that's something to take into account if you have a patient with ILD uh, along with uh, emphysema that has pulmonary hypertension, 
do they, are they really going to derive benefit from this drug? And, and that's something to keep in mind. Um, and then finally, uh, when talking about is my patient, those patients, uh, the inbuilt trial here said that you had to have progression based on the various criteria I, I just mentioned, uh, despite standard treatment. And so, of course, in patients with autoimmune ILD or hypersensitivity and meningitis, uh, immunosuppressant therapy is quite commonly used. And so, as you see here, patients who were treated with azathioprine, uh, or rather patients were not allowed to be treated with azathioprine, mycophenolate, rituximab, cyclophosphamide, or even steroids greater than 20 milligrams during this trial. And so you have to ask yourself whether, uh, for instance, a patient with autoimmune ILD who's experienced progression, have they received standard treatment as, as we define it? Um, granted, we don't have great consensus on all autoimmune ILDs, but uh, you know, we do commonly use immunosuppressant therapy in those patients. So I would have a hard time putting a patient on an antifibrotic drug who hasn't received immunosuppression uh, if they have an inflammatory ILD like connective tissue disease. Um, and that's sort of driven home a bit by this study, which was a subgroup analysis of the census trial, which was looking at nintetinib compared to placebo in patients with SSC ILD. And when they stratified out by patients who were taking mycophenolate at baseline, because mycophenolate was allowed in this trial, uh, we see that those who took MMF alone had roughly the same change in lung function over time as those who received an antetonib alone. Um, that was, of course, better than placebo and numerically uh, not quite as good as combination therapy. And so, um, you know, the, these sort of subgroup analyses, I think, while exploratory to some extent, uh, are helpful because they tell you that, you know, you may not be giving any more benefit with just antetonib. Uh, if a patient hasn't seen MMF first, because of course, MMF can be treating systemic disease and uh, the Nintendo plus MMF group here suggests that maybe we should be studying combination therapy because it may be more efficacious. Um, and then next, ask yourself whether the benefits outweigh the risks. So this is the SLS1 trial here, which showed that cyclophosphamide was better than placebo in patients with SSC ILD. Um, and as would be expected, those with received cyclophosphamide uh, had more hematuria and neutropenia, leukopenia. So if a patient's already struggling with one of these, uh, despite being efficacious for SSC, it may be worth reconsidering the cyclophosphamide and reaching for a different drug. Next, I'm sure most of you asked yourselves or have been asked whether we should be using antetonib and profenadone together in IPF. Uh, well, that was studied and published here in the Blue Journal. And while we do see a, a suggestion of potential efficacy when, when used together based on this longitudinal plot here, uh, we see a whole lot more in the way of GI side effects when used together. And so um, I, I think the uh, question still stands whether we should be using them together, but it is important to acknowledge if you're going to do this for your, for your own patient that somebody already struggling with GI side effects uh, may be struggling a whole lot more if you were to use them together. So with that, I'm going to conclude. Uh, while clinical trials provide critical information for treating interstitial lung disease, having an understanding of their design is, is really just as important as having an understanding of the results. Next, we have these fantastic international consensus guidelines, which are really valuable resources for not only diagnosing, but managing some ILDs. Uh, but they do take years to catch up. They're not done in real time. And so you have to take into account new data that come out after they were published. And when taking into account those new data and integrating them into your clinical practice, uh, it's important to develop a sound understanding of both of the trial design and the side effect profile. So with that, I will thank you. And thanks again to the PFF for asking me to give this talk. I'm Susan Jacobs. I'm a research nurse manager at Stanford in the pulmonary division and also in their interstitial lung disease program. I'm going to be talking today about integrating the American Thoracic Society Oxygen Clinical Practice Guidelines into the care of interstitial lung disease patients. I have no disclosures. So the rationale for the development of these guidelines uh, is based on a significant number, over 5 million people who suffer from chronic lung disease and about 1.5 million use oxygen. The current uh, long-term oxygen treatment prescription is based on studies that are two studies that are over 30 years old. And there's some other guidelines uh, that were developed but did not include some of the more recent studies, particularly the COPD lot study. Um, and so we also find that there's minimal data on interstitial lung disease um, oxygen use. <clears throat> 
The rationale also included uh, activities by the American Thoracic Society. In uh, 2016, the nursing committee noticed the significant problems on, uh, based upon feedback from patients. We went on to develop a, uh, and publish a survey on patient reported uh, perceptions of their oxygen delivery and found numerous problems. And in 2018, uh, an oxygen workshop uh, found a key recommendation that there was identified a lack of evidence-based guidelines as a major gap in care of patients. And therefore, uh, in 2018, we went on to um, uh, convene a panel and create the guidelines, which were recently published in the fall. And then just last month, a summary for clinicians was published in the Annals of ATS. The purpose was to provide a systematic review to guide healthcare providers and develop guidelines that could be applied to patient physiology, their lifestyle, and treatment preferences. We did not address patients who had acute hypoxemia or include uh, pulmonary hypertension issues. The methodology, we use a diverse and expert panel. We agreed upfront on the terminology and defined severe and moderate hypoxemia. The definitions varied study by study, which was a challenge during this process. We created six uh, PICO questions, that's uh, population, intervention, comparator, and outcome, using a Delphi process starting with, I think we had many questions and distilled it down using this process to uh, final key six questions. A medical librarian reviewed literature, methodologists summarized the eligible studies uh, in terms of their quality for each question, and then the panel reviewed those final number of studies under each question um, in terms of design, bias, um, the methods used, et cetera, and ended up with the product of drafting final recommendations. These were three documents, a full manuscripts in the Blue Journal, and uh, an executive summary, and then an online supplement. And of course, during this process, we realized that we were referring a lot to equipment and needed to include uh, basic terminology, definitions, and the three different types of equipment, compressed gas, liquid, and concentrated oxygen. So that was a part of the manuscript. So the summary of recommendations, uh, the first area we looked at was severe chronic resting hypoxemia in both COPD and ILD patients. We uh, included a definition of a PO2, or I'm sorry, saturation less than 88%, and the critical outcome was survival. And the uh, recommendations was a strong recommendation for the use of oxygen with COPD patients with, based on moderate evidence and a strong recommendation for its use in ILD patients, but with low evidence. The first study uh, that was in the 1980s was the MRC trial. And you can see the use of oxygen was compared with no use of oxygen. And the survival benefit was significant uh, with um, comparing the patients who use oxygen a minimum of 15 hours a day to those patients who did not use oxygen. The second study was the NOT trial, which compared using nighttime only oxygen with oxygen at least uh, 18 hours a day. And again, you can see the uh, mortality risk uh, was decreased by 55% over two years. So these two studies really meet the base for our recommendation for chronic resting hypoxemia. There were no studies that met our criteria for the use of uh, oxygen and chronic resting interstitial lung disease patients. So we incorporated the indirect evidence from those two studies that um, examined COPD patients. There was one ILD study, but it was uh, that showed no difference in mortality, however, was unpublished, had a high risk of bias and very low quality evidence. None of the ILD studies looked at outcomes such as dyspnea, fatigue, quality of life, physical activity, or healthcare resource use. So the panel's judgment was that despite there were no ILD studies, that the substantial benefits seen with COPD patients would be extrapolated into our recommendation. And therefore, the recommendation was strong, but based on very low evidence. Other Societies uh, have addressed this issue. The IPF guidelines recommend long-term oxygen, the British Thoracic Society as well. Uh, the implementation includes assessing for pulmonary hypertension in this, in this uh, population and educating patients on the harm of experiencing long-term uh, chronic hypoxemia. 
The research going forward is challenging in this type of a, a setting. So one would have to consider innovative approaches, including uh, clinical trials that were using quasi-experimental designs. The next area that the panel examined was only in COPD patients. This was moderate resting hypoxemia. We did not ask the question for ILD patients, but uh, did make um, a recommendation not to use oxygen in patients with saturations 89 to 93%. Again, we didn't look at that in ILD patients. The fifth question was with ambulatory oxygen, and this is actually a, a, a large area of um, interest. This uh, health-related quality of life was our um, primary outcome. And for COPD and the ILD populations, it was a conditional recommendation and both based on low quality evidence. Uh, conditional means that some patients may or may not choose to use the oxygen, and, and as well, clinicians may or may not, depending on the um, severity of the, of the desaturation. Uh, no ILD studies reported the effects of ambulatory oxygen on fatigue, long-term exercise capacity. Many were short-term, looking at six-minute walk or exercise capacity in a lab setting. Um, also, physical activity and daily life at home was not examined, and, or mortality. And as I mentioned, the quality of evidence was low, um, basically because of lack of studies. Uh, there were no parallel group randomized controlled trials, and only one study looked at evaluating the use of ambulatory oxygen at home. And in that study, actually, uh, two-thirds of the patients chose to continue using that ambulatory oxygen because of the benefits they felt they experienced. So the panel judged that because of the potential for improved health-related quality of life and findings that confirmed improvements in exercise capacity, um, we also had a high value on outside mobility, but there were no long-term studies. Uh, the, were, the recommendations are balanced on the undesirable consequences, which include the safety, the risk of falls, fires, et cetera, um, patient and caregiver burden with the equipment, and inconsistencies in reported symptom relief. What other groups are saying, the IPF guidelines did not address ambulatory oxygen. The British, British Thoracic Society only prescribes it if there's evidence of benefit and ongoing adherence. And the thoracic societies of Australia and New Zealand actually only prescribe ambulatory oxygen if there is an objective improvement in breathlessness and exercise capacity demonstrated in a blinded exercise test on oxygen versus air. So this is a different approach than we use in the United States. Uh, and that was a, a different recommendation and, and a different implementation of portable oxygen in those, in those groups. Um, one of the biggest concerns is ensuring that the devices meet the needs. We see that particularly in our population. The panel did place a high value on facilitating activity outside of the home. And the suggested use means that this could be an area of what we term shared decision-making. The patient is borderline and meets that 88%. Uh, it may be the patient decides they don't want to try it right now, and that would be appropriate, but would include some plan for follow-up and retesting with that patient in the future. We know that interstitial lung disease patients, um, disease can progress rapidly, and that's why oxygen needs can change as well. The last question we addressed was the use of portable liquid oxygen for adults with chronic lung disease who are prescribed continuous flow rates of greater than three liters during exertion. And this recommendation uh, was a suggestion and based on very low quality evidence. Health-related quality of life was the primary outcome. There were no liquid oxygen studies that met our criteria. So therefore we did use some indirect evidence from six COPD studies that used lower uh, flow rates or unreported flow rates, but, but did use liquid oxygen. The panel judgment on indirect evidence uh, did see improvements in some domains of health-related quality of life, improved adherence, and increased time spent outside of the home, which was a, a critical outcome. The undesirable consequences included cost. Uh, many DMEs, the durable medical equipment companies, are unable to provide this type of oxygen due to cost, and the manual ability of some patients to fill these canisters, which you can see here on the bottom. And uh, the potential, there's some potential for burns with the liquid um, oxygen frost. So the rationale was that liquid oxygen uh, is very relevant to a subgroup of patients 
but there's limited data. And the panel plays a high value uh, on, on uh, mobility. So we suggest pre prescribing portable liquid oxygen. This was a conditional recommendation and based again on very low quality evidence simply because the studies are not, um, have not been done. Other groups uh, do recommend the, the, the COPD uh, National Institute for Clinical Excellence recommended small lightweight cylinders, oxygen conserving devices, and portable liquid systems should be available for the treatment of patients with COPD. And the VA prescribed for ambulatory patients who use an extensive amount of oxygen from portable sources. So the implementation is challenging because of the cost and now the lack of availability. And we definitely have advocacy groups working on this and also emphasizing the need uh, for device development for high flow, lightweight portable systems to meet these patients' needs. The last area the panel identified as a standard of care, a minimal expectation is that every patient who's prescribed oxygen is given uh, education and training on the oxygen equipment that they use. Um, including the use, maintenance, and troubleshooting of all equipment, education on safety, smoking cessation, fire prevention, tripping hazards. And this we considered a best practice statement. And you can see the outstanding materials that are available to all patients. It's just a matter of getting them to the patients. So in summary, in integrating these guidelines for our population, patients with interstitial lung disease that have chronic severe resting hypoxemia should use oxygen greater than 15 hours a day to improve survival. So we can tell our patients this data is based on studies from other populations, but we apply it to them as well. Oxygen with exertion only demands more research. Health-related quality of life is improved for some patients, but long-term data is needed. And recommending again, the use of shared decision-making and individualized treatment we know that patients with ILD can have a more rapid saturation pattern compared to others. So tracking these patients and retesting them and making sure their needs are met by their devices is really an ongoing process, but it's one that could be delayed if a patient is borderline and just have that ongoing conversation. The lack of liquid oxygen for our high flow active patients may deny this population the ability to travel, work, socialize, and policy change should move this forward. And lastly, the minimum standard of care should include education and training on oxygen equipment, safety, and self-management for all patients who are newly started on oxygen and ongoing. Thank you. Joe and I would like to thank our speakers, Deborah Gleason, nurse practitioner and research coordinator for the ILD Clinic at University of Kentucky Healthcare in Lexington, Justin Oldham, director of the ILD program at UC Davis Health, and Susan Jacobs, research nurse manager and nurse coordinator for the ILD program, Stanford University. We have some questions for the speakers, but we'd really uh, love to have uh, audience questions. So please submit them. Um, we'll start with a question for Deborah. And um, I think these are gonna, at least mine are gonna start a bit practical. So you're talking on palliative care and the importance of that is resonates, I think, with all of us. What, what do you do if there isn't a palliative care program at your institution, and even in the geographical area where you practice, there are not really great palliative care options. Yeah, and that um, happens a, a lot of places. Um, we're fortunate to be in a, an area that does have palliative care, but I myself am, uh, have a background in palliative care. And I think I probably just refer back to what I said, that there are some great resources um, on the internet, um, CAPSI, that one reference, they actually have really simple modules that providers can go in there and take some basic um, uh, classes on uh, empathetic communication. 
um, listening to your patients and then some symptom management things that even your nurses can do or your um, nurses aides if you have support staff to be able to. So I think probably looking for some resources on the internet to um, increase your knowledge of it. Um, and then also reaching out to colleagues in terms of there are other centers out there that don't have the support of, of palliative care and kind of what they do. Pretty much everybody has a hospice agency. I would hope that at least is, is close to where they are and they are a great resource also. Deborah, I have a question along those lines too. And, and that uh, first one is, is there, uh, you know, in this age now of doing things by Zoom and such, are there is there something moving forward that some palliative care can be done by telemedicine? Yeah, that that area is growing and obviously, especially with um, the pandemic um, and telehealth just exploding, um, there are some uh, hospice and palliative care agencies in the community that did a lot of telehealth um, over the past couple of years. So those agencies that provide those community services actually have the resources um, and the technology to be able to do that. Um, we do a tiny bit of it out of our um, clinic just because we have, we cover such a rural population is that we'll do telehealth visits that may just be talking about supportive care. And, and is there any data out there regarding patient acceptance based upon patient demographics? Not that I know of. Um, the patient acceptance is still a, a big hurdle and sometimes it even extends into provider acceptance. Um, we still have a lot of providers that, um, you know, even on our own field that, that have um, a challenge with looking at palliative care. And I know that several speakers this week have talked about the differences between palliative care and hospice. So um, I think if we start with our, our home group, that will help and maybe uh, pushing that out forward. So Justin, how rigidly uh, do you use the guidelines in terms of applying them to your patients in terms of diagnosis and then the inclusion criteria in terms of treatment? I mean, you touched on this a, a little, but, but practically speaking, um, do you pull the papers out or do you just look for patients who generally fit um, in the categories and in the guidelines and the, and the treatment trials? Yeah, so that's, I think, two different questions in that, um, you know, when applying the criteria for diagnosis, you know, all of us see patients that don't quite meet, you know, check every box for a diagnosis. And so while it's important to be dogmatic when it comes to research and, and um, you know, studying, studying patients, I think it's important to, you know, make sure they meet criteria. But when it comes to treating them in clinic, um, you know, if you recognize a phenotype that that you know, suggests they have IPF um, but don't have classic CT findings, you know I, I think we have to use our clinical gestalt to to treat them in the way we think is most uh, appropriate. As far as you know, using criteria and ent entry criteria, exclusion criteria from trials when when choosing your patients, um, you know, I, I do think that's pretty important. You know, if you look at like the tocilizumab trial in SSC, those patients had higher CRPs than, than you see in some patients. And so you wonder if, you know, if, if that would be effective in somebody that doesn't have more of an inflammatory phenotype. Um, so, you know, I think the inclusion exclusion criteria for a trial uh, is something I adhere to probably a little bit more closely than, than the diagnostic criteria when, when giving somebody a diagnosis. We have an audience question for um, Susan. Uh, did the guideline panel talk about the potential for transtracheal oxygen delivery among those whose resting requirements are very high? We did not. That wasn't uh, the criteria in our evidence search to look at patients with alternative oxygen delivery. Um, transtracheal oxygen is quite rare. I mean, in my area, I actually, used to assist a physician. We had a, a pretty large practice. Um, in my experience, it's less rare. And there's not much published on that um, data in terms of if impact on survival, quality of life, et cetera, with transtracheal oxygen, which is a wonderful, um, although slightly you know, burdensome um, type of oxygen delivery that can 
can help with high flow patients and meet those needs. But we did not look at that. Any, I don't know of any studies that have looked at that, but it wasn't included in our, in our search. Another question for you, do we anticipate any near-term improvement to um, oxygen? What about device innovation, either remote control for flow rates on home concentrator or closed loop system to titrate oxygen delivery based on saturation? Very good question. Uh, we have had some gains there. There are multiple engineering groups, biomedical uh, or biodesign groups that are doing some very innovative work. There were two awards um, posted. One was a small business innovation reward uh, uh, award that was really derived out of patient efforts from the LAM community, which is a rare lung disease with women who often use high flow. And they basically, uh, really propelled uh, this proposal and two, um, two groups were awarded initially for one year and the criteria were exactly what you described. This had to be a high flow, lightweight, portable, FAA approved, remote control uh, device. So we'll hear in a year which of the two groups will get an award to go on to produce that device. And the second award, uh, which the request for submissions just closed was through the NHLBI and I it's either the air we breathe or breathing better I forget but again it was two awards offered to applicants for device innovation in the area of oxygen so we're seeing some interest there uh, we really really you know desperately need that question for uh, Justin Based on inbuilt inclusion criteria, is it your practice to stop immunosuppression prior to starting nintenanib in patients with IPAF, fibrotic systemic sclerosis, and fibrotic HP who progress despite immunosuppressive therapy? Yeah, that's a that is a good question and one I don't know that I have the answer to. But anecdotally, you know, if somebody has what I I think is you know a, a mixed inflammatory fibrotic phenotype, I will often uh, keep the immunosuppression going and, and start nintetinib alongside it. Um, and somebody that has what looks like pretty pure fibrotic changes on their CT and don't you know have a diagnosis of a CTD, um, then it, if, they're, if they're progressing through the immunosuppression, then, then I will at times stop it for them. At times I won't, it, it's really you know, patient level decisions at that point. But I think for connective tissue disease patients, um, it's rare that I'm stopping immunosuppression. So much is changing to another agent and probably starting to tend alongside it. Joe, do you have any anything you want to add to that? Well, I have a, a question that's related to prior guidelines and, and the use of the uh, you know, antacid therapy and the effect of some of these drugs on, uh, for example, mycophenolate absorption. Uh, do you anticipate yes. with the guidelines that there would be any changes uh, based upon evidence that's occurred since the last guidelines as to whether we would continue to recommend the use of the uh, proton pump inhibitors in patients who you know, weren't symptomatic and requiring them? Yeah, I would be very surprised if the new guideline, which will be out soon, um, gives a recommendation to keep using uh, antacid therapy if, if there isn't a clinical indication for symptomatic GERD. Um, I, I don't, I, I think the data, you know, by no means support its use um, among all comers. And until there's a randomized control trial, you know, su supporting its use, which I have yet to see, um, I, I can't imagine there would be a blanket recommendation for the use of that. And, you know, you have to keep in mind that was in IPF, right? And so we're not using microphenolate generally in IPF. And, and so um, it, it, it's questionable whether, you know, what we see in IPF is gonna be true of non-IPF ILDs um, but there is some disease inherent um, differences that need to be you know, kept in mind. SSC, for example, has a lot of esophageal problems and um, antacid therapy in them might be more indicated than perhaps we see in, in IPF. Question for Deborah: Any data on use of opioids as part of palliative care for ILD? And uh, if so, um, or if you advocate even without data, who should manage palliative care, primary care, or pulmonary? 
Good question. Um, I think um, as far as opioids in our ILD population, there are some studies out there. I believe Dr. Kaluria has done some studies on um, uh, use of opioids, um, especially in our IPF patients. Um, but I think the big hurdle with that is that um, we have providers that um, still try to very much steer clear of opioids. Um, coming from a palliative care background, I'm very comfortable in that arena um, because of the symptoms that we manage. But I think that we still have many providers um, that shy away from that, even in situations of pain and dyspnea. And so um, what the best thing we can do is really educate them um, in terms of um, the use, the beneficial use, and when it's appropriate and when it's not appropriate. Um, and I think that um, you know any provider can be able to do that, um, but I think it's been left to um, palliative care providers or hospice providers. Yeah, maybe yeah, some maybe assistance with, with dosing as well. Yeah, and it comes in so many different um, doses, and and um, you know the most thing that we used to use in palliative care in the community was sublingual morphine um, that can be very helpful. But I have had um, patients with dyspnea on long-acting morphine also. Uh, a comment, uh, UCSF provides telehealth palliative care teams to some of its ILD patients. Um, thought that was a great discussion and a really great, great idea. Um, any I have a question for um, Susan and uh, a couple of things, you know, was it discussed about high altitude uh, stimulation tests? Did you discuss that as part of your deliberations? No, it wasn't included in our you know, the data review was really looking at studies to support the use of oxygen at normal, at sea level. We didn't look at uh, high altitude, but certainly with travel, that's something that we recommend, but it wasn't part of this recommendation. Yeah. And, and, and we were kind of cut off during part of your presentation for nighttime uh, testing. Uh, was there any discussion regarding this? No, we also didn't, except some of the studies included uh, criteria that included nocturnal desaturation. Uh, so that was a recommendation in general, retesting and monitoring, but we didn't specifically address only sleep studies separately. But some of the samples included patients with nocturnal desaturation. Thank you. Great. Again, uh, thanks to all of our uh, speakers, panelists for their great presentations and uh, for um, people who submitted questions. We really appreciate that. We're going to wrap it up. There'll be a 30 minute break and then we'll be back for the third set of lectures. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am Dr. Lisa Allensback from Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit, Michigan, um, and the medical director of the lung transplant program at Henry Ford. I'm very pleased today to share with you indications and contraindications to lung transplantation. Our general outline today will be over the next 15 minutes to talk about some general guidelines to selection for transplant introduction of the lung allocation score and how it affects who gets a transplant, medical comorbidities and their effect on eligibility, and then to go over some disease specific criteria and when each disease uh, is at a stage where we consider transplant. So in general, the guidelines to patient selection are, we look for individuals have, who have exhausted all other medical options for, for their disease. We typically look for people who have less than a 50% chance of survival at two years. And we also wanna make sure that they're realizing a net benefit of transplant so that they have a greater than 80% survival likelihood at 90 days. The ideal candidates must have ambulatory rehab potential. So they must be able to get up, get out of bed, ride a bicycle after transplant in order to make these lungs work. We screen very carefully for individuals' support systems because it takes 
a number of people to make a transplant work. And we really want to make sure that individuals have the right group around them, um, that they themselves have the right psychiatric profile to adhere to a very complex medical regimen. We also want to make sure that they don't have any comorbidities which would limit their lifespan to less than five years. So in an effort to try to utilize lungs to the maximum ability, we want to make sure we're selecting people who are sick enough to really see a benefit. And so for the first two decades of lung transplantation, patients got on lists, they waited, they waited their time, and when their name came up, they were transplanted, and it really made no difference how sick they were or if they weren't able to survive that wait. And then the lung allocation scoring system was created, and it was designed really to be able to select those individuals who are most in need. Um, we like to be able to think of this lung allocation scoring as really selecting out people who can't live without a lung transplant and yet still have the ability to do well with the transplant and survive well. Um, the lung allocation scoring system um, created a very, very sort of a different uh, cohort of patients who are likely to be transplanted. And it really favored patients with IPF over individuals with COPD. As you can see from this slide, the, um, as we look at the diseases that are uh, getting transplanted over uh, the last, uh, I guess, 20 years, we can see that the fastest growing group of individuals is, is located in this white bar here, and those are individuals with IPF. So as lung allocation scoring recognized how quickly individuals with lung with IPF uh, were progressing to death actually without transplant, it switched the priority over individuals with COPD, which now is relatively flat. Um, and I think this has been an overall uh, great benefit to our lung transplant uh, community. I think one of the fastest changing kind of uh, indicators for transplant has been the recipient age criteria. And the upper age limit has really not been well established, but in general, I could say that anyone over the age of 75 is unlikely to be a candidate. Age is considered um, together with comorbidities. So people who have a lot of other uh, medical diseases uh, that would in fact affect their overall performance status uh, are generally a candidate only if they're younger, but not as they reach 70 or even 75. In 2019, over 35% of transplants occurred in individuals over the age of 65. This uh, slide from our IS ISHLT registry, I think nicely outlines this. And if we look at the red bar of individuals over the age of 65, you can see that it is actually the most rapidly growing group of individuals receiving lung transplantation. So we look at some absolute contraindications, who is absolutely not a candidate, and that would be people who have any active, ongoing, extra pulmonary infections. We want those treated. We want people free of malignancy. We mandate that people have a BMI of less than 35. Uh, we, do, we make sure that no one is using any form of tobacco for at least six months prior to being on our list, and they must, must be committed to lifelong abstinence from tobacco and without any history of other drugs or substance abuses, including alcohol. We want to make sure that the individual, if they have coronary disease or blockage in their coronary arteries, that that has been treated and that their left ventricle or their overall heart function is strong, usually with a, an ejection fraction of greater than 45%. We're particularly careful to look at kidney, liver, and GI tract um, dysfunction just to make sure that other organs don't get in the way of success of the lung transplant. Some relative contraindications. So, if somebody's BMI is obese, greater than 30, but less than 35, that poses a risk, but we still usually will accept those individuals as long as they continue losing weight. We like to have them um, not severely malnourished, and if they are, we'll put a feeding tube in to support them. We look carefully for osteoporosis and have that treated. 
Um, if somebody has highly resistant organisms in their native lung, we would look and make sure that they have um, an ability to have an antibiotic regimen that would be effective after transplant. We are now successfully transplanting individuals with HIV as long as it has been controlled. And then if they've had hepatitis, again, we'll want that treated. And then extensive surgeries in their chest also pose a risk. And if that is the case, um, we try to avoid the lung that's had extensive thoracic surgery if it's at all possible. Because when we try to take out a lung that's seen a lot of surgery, it often has a very high risk of bleeding after transplant and it can pose a, a, a recovery problem. With that said, people going into lung trans because of a lung transplantation because of their lung disease oftentimes have a number of diseases as, as are listed on the screen. And some of it has to do with the actual lung disease and others have to do with how we treat it. For example, many lung diseases are treated with corticosteroids. And so uh, use of corticosteroids poses a healing risk after transplant. So we try to minimize that if at all possible. So in some of these diseases, particularly malignancy, coronary artery disease, are affected by individuals who smoke or are caused by people who had a heavy smoking history. So those two things oftentimes we screen very, very carefully for uh, in individuals. So some of the diseases, the four most common diseases that we think about for transplant are listed here. Um, They're emphysema or COPD, pulmonary fibrosis, cystic fibrosis, and primary pulmonary hypertension. So emphysema is still the most common indication for lung transplant. And unlike pulmonary fibrosis, emphysema can be hard to predict lifespan in. So people can have a very, very poor quality of life, be dependent on oxygen, be in and out of the hospital, but technically not life-threatening in that they're not dying of their disease. There have been a number of indices that have been um, investigated to try to better predict who will survive with emphysema and who will not. And one of the best is a Bode index. And this is a, an index that takes into account people's weight, their pulmonary function testing, their level of dyspnea on a scale when we ask them how short of breath are you, and finally, what their exercise capacity is. The higher the score, the overall higher the mortality. And generally, we're listing people who would have a Bode score above seven. These are the exact points they get for the Bode score. Um, and in general, this is uh, one reliable indicator, but even people with high Bode scores may survive five or 10 years. So we are trying to look for other things in addition. Um, we look at their degree of obstruction on their PFTs or their FEV1, and we'd like that to be ideally, um, if we're putting them on a transplant list, less than 25% of predicted. Most all emphysema patients being listed for transplant will be oxygen dependent, and most will be dependent on oxygen at rest, not with ex only with exertion. If patients develop high carbon dioxide levels, that's also an indicator of severity of disease with emphysema. And finally, if they have pulmonary high blood pressure, pulmonary hypertension, or right-sided heart failure due to their emphysema, lung transplant is indicated. So how about of interest to this group, in particular, lung transplant with uh, IPF or pathological UIP? So we know that idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis has a poor overall survival with a median time of survival uh, from the diagnosis of four years. But we must remember many people have had this disease not correctly diagnosed for, for m many years before their exact diagnosis. We know the pace of decline with IPF is variable and oftentimes stepwise. And we also know that acute exacerbations, although unpredictable, have a very high mortality rate. So we feel very strongly that people should be referred to a transplant center at the time of their diagnosis with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis.
So IPF um, can come in all different flat kind of flavors and forms. And we know um, biopsies are less commonly done than they were a decade ago. But we, if we do have a biopsy and we see UIP pathologically as opposed to NSIP, which has more of an inflammatory uh, component to it, it carries a worse prognosis. If we see on a CAT scan a lot of honeycombing, which is a permanent destruction of the lung versus ground glass, which is an inflammation of the lung, honeycombing has a poorer prognosis. We look carefully at PFTs and especially what happens over time. And when the diffusion capacity or the ability to exchange oxygen throughout the lung gets to a critical number of 39% or sometimes even a little bit higher than that, we think that somebody should be transplanted. At the moment, people are needing oxygen uh, with IPF is really an indicator to have them on a transplant list because you can see their four-year survival is low. Pulmonary hypertension is a poor sign, um, especially when it is severe. It carries a poor overall survival without transplant. And so we really want to identify anyone developing this and have them on a transplant list if they're eligible. And finally, if somebody is having acute exacerbation where they end up in an ICU on a ventilator, uh, they're very, very unlikely to recover. Unfortunately, we see a lot of people for transplant at this stage, but ideally we would like to see them sooner. Cystic fibrosis is another disease we consider for transplant. It's an autosomal recessive disease and it's long-term survival for most individuals will require lung transplant. We know that people who are low um, FEV1 females and younger individuals tend to have a worse outcome once they've lost their lung capacity. And we're careful to look at what types, types of bacteria are in their lung because they're oftentimes very resistant and we want that antibiotic um, sort of um, plan for after transplant. So in general, we want to see patients with cystic fibrosis when they're having a rapid decline in their lung function, if they're requiring oxygen or not ridding themselves of carbon dioxide, if they have pulmonary hypertension, or if overall their functional status is really declining. And then some individuals will deal with life-threatening hemoptysis or coughing of blood, uh, which is another indicator for transplant. And so the last category, pulmonary hypertension, is uh, one of the fields in pulmonary medicine that has seen the most advances medically. And it used to require transplant, but now there are many medicines that are available. Usually people take multiple medicines at the same time with an additive effect. And only once those medicines don't work and their functional status declines are they a transplant candidate. So the, the last message, this slide is, um, is probably 25 years old and it hasn't changed. And that is there is a window of opportunity for transplant. We don't wanna see people too early, but we, there's also a, a point at which people can't survive a, such an extensive surgery. So to conclude, um, uh, the message is, is that lung transplant definitely offers improved quality of life and survival to carefully selected individuals with end-stage lung disease. We uh, wanna pay careful attention to their existing medical conditions and the natural history of someone's lung disease will indicate when lung transplant should be considered. So thank you very much. And I look forward to our question and answer session uh, uh, after all the presentations. Thank you. Hello, I wanted to thank the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation today for the opportunity to come and speak with you about management of the hospitalized patient. I'm Shelley Schmidt, I'm the director of the Pulmonary Fibrosis Program at Spectrum Health. During today's presentation, I have no personal financial interests in commercial entities to disclose. And I'm starting the presentation today with really the answer to the question. So the primary management of the hospitalized pulmonary fibrosis patient is to prevent the hospitalization in the first place. No one wants to see a hospitalized pulmonary fibrosis patient, whether it's the patient caregivers or the healthcare team caring for them.
And so in order to prevent those hospitalizations, we have to take a, a closer look at what usually causes them. And that's the acute exacerbation. This slide denotes a consensus di uh, definition for acute exacerbations of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, but we can extrapolate this information to really all forms of pulmonary fibrosis, that it's an acute significant deterioration that is associated with widespread inflammation that we see on, on CT scan as ground glass opacities in the setting of more set in pulmonary fibrosis and what we call the UIP pattern. And so that can be the case, whether it's idiopathic or rheumatoid lung or chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So in addition to that, the duration of symptoms are typically an onset of less than a month and the deterioration is not associated with something like congestive heart failure. There are common themes around these acute exacerbations and this, this really gets to the point of prevention. So with acute exacerbations, as we mentioned, they're more commonly seen in patients who have a UIP pattern on their uh, radiographic imaging, but they're also more likely as patients age and as the lung function worsens over time. But the ideology or the causes of acute exacerbations are really our causes of acute lung injury. And far and above what I see most often is that respiratory infections lead to acute exacerbations. So colds that go to the chest or pneumonias, a severe flu, these are the sorts of things that can lead to acute exacerbations. But also anything that can disrupt that epithelial layer which progresses to more fibrosis in an injury form can also cause an exacerbation such as aspiration episodes and although not part of the consensus document, inhalation injuries. And so here in more rural areas of Michigan where patients are using wood stoves uh, to burn for heat or burning wood piles, smoke inhalation injuries, or even chemicals like pool chemicals can also lead to acute exacerbations. Medications are well known to do this. And most commonly we see this in the setting of chemotherapy agents, but can also see it in uh, well-known medications like amiodarone and macrodentin. And then also in the setting of a post-operative setting with most usually chest surgery or where the anesthesiologist is just ventilating one lung is where it's most commonly seen, but also long duration surgeries or long duration spine surgeries can also be places where people exacerbate. With other forms of pulmonary fibrosis, there are other entities that get added to the mix. And so with fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonia, it could be a new antigen that the patient's exposed to or a recurrent antigen. With connective tissue diseases or sarcoid, it could be that the underlying disease itself is flaring as these are often uh, waxing and waning disease processes. And I would say since the COVID pandemic over this last year to two, we've been seeing discontinuation or inadequate medical therapy has been a cause of exacerbation, specifically discontinuation of antifibrotics due to more difficulty obtaining them due to cost, but also our immune suppressed population has occasionally been discontinuation medications out of the fear for obtaining COVID. So an ounce of prevention is really not just a pound of cure with pulmonary fibrosis and with exacerbations, it's actually life saving. And communication is really the key to that communicating with the pulmonary fibrosis center or your pulmonologist if you have developed any of these areas of concern from respiratory infections to aspiration or new medications. Educating our patients on how to protect themselves. Our patients were first in vogue wearing masks uh, to church well prior to COVID. So keeping themselves protected from, patient, from other population who could be sick, um, not getting too huggy at church, wearing our masks, hand sanitizing, to try to reduce those respiratory infections. Helping our patients identify when there's a problem. So if we're getting into week one to two of having that respiratory infection, then that's probably worth a call, especially if we're having increasing cough, dyspnea, fatigue, or an increased oxygen requirement. Or if the patient is noticing that they're putting a string of bad days together and not having the intervening good days any longer, that could suggest that something more is going on.
Our care centers are also important to help us anticipate problems before they happen. And this could be with new medications, a new cancer diagnosis and new proposed medications. We often use pneumotox to help us identify those medications that have been reported to cause underlying lung disease, but also new medical therapies like radiation therapy or major surgeries like we discussed that are really something we should be talking about the risks and benefits of before they happen. And this is really where our care centers and our care center network is so important because that gives that availability to the patient and the family to discuss these issues ahead of time, to triage their concerns, perhaps provide a telehealth visit if we need it, or urgent in-person visits if we're concerned about an early exacerbation. Despite these best efforts, or sometimes we meet patients uh, de novo as they come into hospital, which is what happened here with uh, Ruth. I'll just give a quick example of a 65-year-old woman admitted with seven days of progressive dyspnea and cough and found to be an acute hypoxic respiratory failure. She'd never been on supplemental oxygen previously. Six months prior, she'd been treated by her primary care physician for some diffuse arthralgias, which responded to prednisone. But when she tried to discontinue the prednisone, they recurred. And so he had her restart with the plan uh, to come up to Michigan for the summer. And when she comes back, they'll talk about de-escalating. And importantly, her older brother had passed from pulmonary fibrosis. Ruth's initial CT scan had the hallmarks that we might expect of someone who had pulmonary fibrosis, but unfortunately to her did not know she had this diagnosis. So what we can see on this uh, cross-sectional image of the CT scan is that um, in this bottom right-hand corner, she has these little dark circles of the honeycomb cysts that we see associated with a UIP type pattern. She also has evidence over here on the uh, left side of the screen, traction bronchiectasis and reticulation, all consistent with pulmonary fibrosis and the architectural distortion that goes with pulmonary fibrosis. But higher up in her scan, we can also see evidence of the diffuse inflammation. So while in the uh, top right of the scan, the uh, tissue is more dark as we would see, down in the sort of mid range, we see some light gray areas, uh, which are the ground glass opacities. We see them on both the left and the right. Um, interestingly, in her CT scan, we could also see some evidence of some more central bronchiectasis, especially up here in the upper um, right-hand side of the screen, which suggests it's a little abnormal for just a straightforward IPF. And so at this point, we're thinking, okay, this could be either an IPF exacerbation with some uh, radiographic findings that are a little unusual, or we could be dealing with a connective tissue disease, ILD, and that prior arthralgias is actually playing a role. In the workup of connective tissue disease ILD, there are some relatively uh, specific places to go uh, to try to figure out if that's what we're dealing with with a patient. And historically speaking, these issues can be morning stiffness, especially in the sort of like the knuckles and, um, and the uh, lower joints of the hands uh, for more than two hours or, or are more specific for rheumatoid arthritis as opposed to other forms of arthritis. Raynaud's phenomenon, rash, whether that's a malar rash or if you consider telangiectasias a rash um, or a rash over the extensor surface of the digits, sickest symptoms with dry eye, dry mouth, reflux disease or proximal muscle weakness, getting difficulty getting out of a chair or, um, or upstairs. And then the physical exam is really focused on the skin, fingers and joints. And so we're really looking for things that might tell us, and I'd say mechanics hands uh, for inflammatory myopathy is something that pops up um, more often than we'd like when we see a patient coming off of prednisone to tell us uh, that we actually have an underlying connective tissue disease there. From a laboratory study perspective, uh, we have labs, including the ANA for lupus, SSA and SSB for Sjogren's, SCL70 centromere for scleroderma, RF anti-CCP for rheumatoid and CK Joe one for um, inflammatory myositis. There are additional antibodies for each of those areas as well. These are sort of the sort of basic maybe kind of screening depending on uh, your physical exam and history. And I do want to make a point of being careful with the reflex panels, because if your uh, laboratory is trying to reduce costs with these autoimmune panels and only doing these secondary antibodies if the ANA reflex is positive, then we're going to miss the answer, in part because rheumatoid arthritis and inflammatory myopathies uh, do not give a positive ANA. And unless there's some kind of overlap syndrome. So we'll miss those entirely. 
And the sensitivity of ANA for, for Sjogren's and scleroderma is not perfect. So for Sjogren's, it's less than 50%. And for scleroderma, it's in this kind of 40 to 70% range. And so if you have suspicion, those secondary antibodies are important to order. And you may get some additional imaging, um, such as hand films for rheumatoid or an esophagram if we're concerned about scleroderma or reflux. What we see here on her hand films is a bit of what I saw on exam, which is at the very tops in her distal interphalangeal joints, there's a lot of joint destruction. And so originally I thought this was just gonna be osteoarthritis associated with that, but she does have some joint destruction in the left um, index finger here at the uh, PIP and then down in the metacarpals as well. And so that was a concerning scan with maybe some mixed uh, disease, but concerning for destructive disease. And then our laboratory studies were showing us that uh, from our definition of through the roof on her uh, anti-cyclic citrullinated peptide, that rheumatoid arthritis may very well be at play. And in a case like this, coming in with acute symptoms on prednisone, we did perform bronchoscopy to ensure there wasn't a secondary infection. But without those things, then we were falling more towards a rheumatoid flare and pulmonary fibrosis, a rheumatoid patient with UIP pattern on CT. And so from Dr. Wiesenbeek's and Cotton's uh, review in the New England Journal last year, we have, we actually fit in this, <laughs> this graph with rheumatoid ILD and are seeing disease progression. So we need to reconsider our management. And in the hospital, um, really that focus is gonna be on glucocorticoids. And so we can see though here on this, um, on this picture that between rheumatoid, sarcoid, chronic, uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis or fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis, NSIP and unclassifiable, that steroids and immune suppression are a component, an important component to the therapy and assessing response to those things. The little gray boxes are the secondary steroid sparing agents that we move to um, after glucocorticoids or in conjunction with, in part because glucocorticoids are the fastest at immune suppressing. So that's where we start. And then we work in our other meds, um, sometimes right away or a little after, and then considering antifibrotic agents as, we, um, as well, as noted in the purple boxes. So glucocorticoids are really sort of the hallmark of treatment for acute exacerbations for pulmonary fibrosis, for connective tissue disease, ILD, often in combination with rheumatology consultation. In our center, we use methylprednisolone, and we're typically using one to two mg per kg up to a pulse of 500 to 1,000 milligrams every 24 hours for three days to start, depending on how severe the flare is. Um, and then consideration to start a steroid, steroid sparing agent, especially if we're up at those pulse doses where we're going to need more help. Um, with idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, it's a weak consensus recommendation for therapy. And in our center, we typically use about 240 to 500 milligrams of uh, methylprednisolone in divided doses over the first few days to assess for um, improvement. Mm -hmm. And so um, there, uh, importantly, are no randomized control trials to use steroids in this setting. And so this is a, sort of an expert opinion uh, decision of what's been happening uh, both at our center and at many other centers. But importantly, we do not have randomized studies to suggest that this is required. And it's not really known if these patients would improve on their own uh, without the steroids. There's also consideration to optimize antifibrotic therapy if the patient wasn't started on antifibrotic therapy or had come off it. Um, the responses to therapy are assessed by the oxygen requirement, symptoms, and radiographic changes. And they're often protracted tapers driven by symptoms and objective data. Supportive care in the hospital as well, supplemental oxygen, optimizing fluid status. And then it's important to keep these patients moving, PT, OT, and if needed, palliative care. Clinical trials, however, in this area are desperately needed. And while there are nearly a dozen other medications that have been used in acute exacerbation, we have not up to this point done those in a randomized fashion. I will bring up the antifibrotics because they do have their own sets of randomized controlled trials. And with their data and with their pooled data suggests for both intentinib and profenadone that patients are probably less likely to exacerbate on these medicines and they're probably more likely to stabilize after exacerbation. So in summary, our goal 
primary goal is to avoid hospitalization with great communication with our patients and their caregivers, education and awareness for them, and having the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation Care Center availability to help them work through and uh, pr ideally prevent that hospitalization. If they get to hospital, well, I, I certainly agree always with Dr. Osler's just listen to your patient because he, she, or they is telling you the diagnosis. And that can especially be true with connective tissue disease, ILD. But we also need a little bit more high tech, uh, sometimes some lab CT scan or plus or minus bronchoscopy to make that diagnosis. High dose steroids are the typical therapy that are used with steroid sparing agents of a variety of types depending on the underlying disease with antifibrotic therapy and very supportive care for these families, especially after discharge where these patients are frequently on new oxygen or a much higher dose of oxygen that limits their activities, getting them uh, connected with pulmonary rehabilitation. And if this wasn't the case prior to exacerbation, connected to transplant evaluation if they're a good candidate and palliative care. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Stay safe out there. So thanks to Dr. Lisa Ellensbach, Medical Director, Henry Ford Hospital, a lung transplant program of which she was one of the founders, and Dr. Shelley Schmidt, Director of Pulmonary Fibrosis Center and Critical Care Specialist at Spectrum Health Grand Rapids, Michigan, for really, really outstanding talks. Uh, we already have some questions coming in, and we really would be happy to answer any and all questions. The first question is for uh, Dr. Alan Spock, uh, Lisa. As we see an increase of patients with connective tissue ILD with progressive fibrosis, are there other criteria that are contraindications to transplant in that population? Well, I think that, you know, one of the basic premises is that we always want to make sure that people have irreversible disease. So we do know in the cohort of patients with uh, connective tissue disease, some will be more responsive than others. So we do take the underlying disease into consideration. For example, individuals with rheumatoid arthritis, we know carry a higher uh, risk of fatality do that, than do other groups of connective tissue disease. But we also want to look, I think, at the systemic effect of the connective tissue disease. And so how does it affect the rest of them? Uh, for example, individuals with scleroderma or mixed connective tissue disease, we pay great care in looking at their esophageal motility, making sure that we're not um, transplanting people that are at very high risk of aspiration after transplant. So that's sort of an important key factor that we look at. Uh, but with that said, it's a very rapidly growing group of uh, population of patients that are being transplanted with uh, connective tissue disease related ILD. What's your feeling about rituximab as a treatment for their CTD ILD? Is that a contraindication, relative or absolute for lung transplant? Yeah, I think we have used it as a relative contraindication. So we have still transplanted people, uh, particularly people that have, you know, an acute exacerbation relative to the time of the rituximab. If we have the luxury of stopping it and we know somebody has end-stage disease that's been unresponsive, we will do that. So we'd like to try to minimize the risk of that drug if we can, but we have not used it as an absolute contraindication, kind of very similar to steroid dosing. So we oftentimes will see people who are very end-stage uh, with, with IPF who have been on high doses of, of steroids for years um, and we're still transplanting those individuals, but it is definitely a higher risk for, um, for a worse outcome, for wound healing, for dehiscence of the anastomosis. So again, something that we would really try to minimize and hope to get their steroid dose down to 10 milligrams or less if it's, if it's an option for someone. Does it matter if the IPF patients are on antifibrotics? How does that affect their, the possibility of transplant? And do you need to modify the dosing or stop them? We have not stopped antifibrotics. In fact, we, we've encouraged people, if they're tolerating them well, uh, to continue on antifibrotics with an evidence that hopefully this slows down progression. And we have not mandated that they be stopped in any way. Joe, do you have any questions? 
I, I think another question just popped up uh, from the audience. We'll give them that opportunity. Uh, what is the time frame when you say post COVID patients will not recover and would likely need a transplant? Well, that's a great question. And I don't think that anyone really knows the answer to that. So at Henry Ford, we have transplanted seven individuals with uh, COVID related lung disease. All of those patients have been transplanted off of ECMO. We have not transplanted anyone with fibrotic disease um, that is not an ARDS. Uh, we are following a number of patients uh, who are on still high amounts of oxygen. Uh, but what we've noticed is that a lot of people seem to be stable, if not um, improving. I think the cohort of patients that are um, you know, probably in need of transplant after COVID are those with underlying fibrosis. And we do have a number of people who had very mild IPF, not oxygen requiring contracted COVID and then have declined and have had actually rapid progression of their IPF after COVID. So I think right now we have a number of different cohorts of patients. Um, our indicator has really been ARDS. We have mandated that people be at least a month away from their uh, viral infection. By UNOS criteria, they have to have two negative COVID swabs 24 hours apart to be placed on the transplant list. Um, the majority of patients that we have done have been more than two months after their COVID infection. So we have really tried to give everybody the benefit of recovery prior to offering lung transplant. In the group of individuals that has undergone transplant, in general, um, they are patients who oftentimes have had barotrauma. So many of them have chest tubes in place at the time of their transplant. Um, and it doesn't seem to me as though there's sort of a, you know, sort of a gray zone in these people. These people clearly have um, such horrible ventilatory parameters. They've had to be placed on ECMO. They've not had any signs that their lungs are recovering. Um, and so it doesn't seem like in that group of patients, it's really a, a, an option not to transplant them. Uh, we have run into a lot of difficulties with individuals who then develop um, organ failure after they're listed on ECMO or people who have had complications of infection with ECMO. We um, did transplant one of our seven who had ongoing infection and that probably did not leave the hospital. And I think it was really a reflection of the fact of all the infections that were related to his ventilatory stay. Um, so I think it's something that's yet to be defined. Um, when we look at the vast majority of um, transplants being done in this country, they're not for COVID. I mean, there have only been about 160 lung transplants reported to UNOS with a diagnosis of either COVID fibrosis combined with COVID ARDS. So it certainly at this point is really a minority of transplants happening. Shelley, as we think about ways to prevent acute exacerbations and patients needing lung transplant, what do you recommend preoperatively when you evaluate a patient um, who has ILD? Um, what is it that you tell the surgeon, the anesthesiologist, the patient in terms of what can be done to minimize the risk um, during and after surgery? So surgeries are, are a time that are, uh, although a, a low risk, but they are a time that can lead to exacerbation and seem to be most commonly done as we were discussing on ch in chest surgeries, um, but can also be in very protracted long surgeries as well. And so usually our, our first um, interaction we try to have with the operative team is, is there any way, depending on the procedure, it could be done without mechanical ventilation? And so most commonly, uh, our orthopedic surgeries are, are usually pretty well handled in our patients with pulmonary fibrosis. Many times they can use blocks or regional anesthesia so that we can get away from general endotracheal anesthesia. And so if we have that option at all, you know, hernia repairs, joints, anything like that, we usually work that uh, method. Um, it, you know, in patients who have severe cardiac disease, these are the trickiest ones to try to determine what's the right thing to do. Um, because if there's, a, you know, any, even with some sometimes mild pulmonary fibrosis, but certainly if it's, it's more moderate to severe, 
these patients can go from a, a limited but functional status to not leaving the hospital. And so it can be very scary in that patient population. And so if we are talking about a chest surgery, um, the, is, especially if the patient, again, is moderate fibrosis and or has an oxygen requirement, we most of the time try to steer another method, medical management or some other percutaneous management to try to keep the patient away um, from either single lung ventilation or the mechanical ventilator. Um, and these are multidisciplinary discussions that we're having, um, which again, I think is, is so important with these patients to make sure that they don't accidentally wander into uh, a surgery without knowing uh, what the potential risks and pitfalls are going to be. And so, um, so that uh, wide open conversation with your doctor, with your pulmonologist when you're heading into surgery is, is very important so we can try to mitigate whatever risk we can. Question about, can you discuss donor lungs uh, if there's been a history of COVID? So can a COVID infected patient be a donor? Yes, um, so absolutely they can. Uh, there, you know, in the beginning of the pandemic, um, I think it was just such a learning curve for everybody. And there was a great fear of transplant in terms of not wanting to ever run a risk of transplanting COVID uh, from a donor into a recipient. Um, and so at this point in time, um, we have uh, two samples always obtained from a donor, uh, two lower respiratory tract samples obtained uh, through bronchoscopy, usually sometimes a tracheal aspirate is one of those two um, to make sure that there's no uh, COVID positivity. Uh, there's a lot of screening that goes into terms of the, in terms of the history of the donor and how if they had symptoms prior to coming in, um, if the CT would be compatible. Um, so in that respect, we try um, every screening method uh, that we have really available, both history and, um, and COVID PCR to determine that the donor would be negative. Um, with that said, as I was sort of preparing for a talk in the beginning of the week, I did read a case report of a, a COVID, um, an active COVID donor. This was a European donor transplanted into a COVID recipient um, who was being transplanted for COVID. Um, so I think that's certainly way out of the box and not something I've, I've uh, ever thought we would consider, but is something I guess as we're all learning, uh, maybe in the future, who knows. Uh, but in general, I think that if you've had a history of COVID and you've recovered um, and you have no residual lung disease, you would be certainly suited to be a candidate for organ donation. If a patient calls and says they've been sick for a week with a respiratory infection, what can they expect to be done to try and keep them out of the hospital? How aggressively are they treated to keep them out of the hospital? So um, in, our, in our center, we try very aggressively <laughs> to keep these patients out of the hospital. What I usually explain to patients is to not be um, afraid just because you get a cold. You know, if this is something that stays kind of up here, up in the head, you know, up in the throat, comes and goes within, you know, five to seven days, it's a typical cold. You don't have to fear every cold that you have. Um, but, but if it does start to move into the chest, um, let's say we're coughing up more phlegm, um, maybe we're getting some more shortness of breath, tightness, they're noticing a little bit more oxygen requirement, then we definitely want to call uh, early. And so we'd rather find out about that in week one to two, as opposed to week, you know, six to eight when we're really in trouble. And so, so those are patients that, that we are, are pretty free uh, with antibiotics and steroids early on. Um, we oftentimes will obviously swab the patients um, pre-COVID times to see what other respiratory viruses, um, so we could try to get a feel if this is going to be something viral or bacterial, but, but we tend to be pretty aggressive uh, trying to get some sort of plan in place if they're having especially more cough, phlegm production, increased oxygen requirements, so we can try to see if we can turn that around. Question about the routine use of myositis panels, as sometimes patients do pre present with autoimmune process that seems to be relatively lung limited. Yeah, that's a really tricky one because these are not cheap panels. <laughs> so uh, while I had that list in the slide deck, it's probably an $800 set of panels there. And so it's it's not uh, inconsequential. And so um, 
the CK is obviously a very cheap uh, way to try to get a feel for whether or not you're going to be heading down a myositis pathway. And so clearly, if I have a patient with an elevated CK and the right types of um, uh, usually the imaging study, a lot of times the antisynthetase um, ILDs tend to hug the diaphragm and get a lot of um, traction bronchiectasis. If I see that right type of picture with that, um, that might get me to order a myositis panel without a CK. Um, if it's something where I'm not exactly sure, I might might sort of start with the CK and then see if there's some other abnormality that leads me down that bigger myositis panel. But we've all certainly diagnosed these patients um, without an elevated CK. And as you may know, they're identifying new antisynthetase antibodies, it feels like every 15 minutes. And so it, it can be difficult to keep up with them. But the things that really trigger me is, is really the right radiographic appearance triggers me to send a panel um, and an, an elevated CK as well. Thanks Joe, so much. Do you, have, do you have any additional comments, questions? Uh... Um, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Rishi Raj. I direct the Interstitial Lung Diseases Program here at Stanford. And we'll spend the next 10 minutes discussing a case that we saw in our ILD clinic not too long ago. And uh, uh, joining me um, are, are uh, uh, the faculty that you see here. Dr. Leung is a professor of radiology at Stanford, uh, associate uh, chair of radiology, and she directs the thoracic radiology program. Uh, Dr. Berry, professor of uh, pathology, and directs the uh, cardiac and pulmonary pathology program here at Stanford. Uh, uh, Susan Jacobs, uh, um, she's one of the uh, board of directors of PFF, uh, an international oxygen expert, and she directs our uh, uh, clinical research uh, program here in pulmonary division at Stanford. Uh, um, uh, Dr. DeBoer is an assistant professor of uh, medicine here at Stanford in the pulmonary division, one of our core ILD faculty. Uh, and then Dr. Josh Mooney, um, uh, Assistant Professor of Medicine here at Stanford in the Pulmonary Division, uh, does ILD and transplant and is one of our uh, core ILD uh, faculty. Um, so with this, uh, uh, we'll start our case here. Let's uh, go to the slides, please. Great. Uh, so our first case is a 39-year-old male who had history of gastroesophageal reflux disease a um, couple of other minor medical problems, uh, high functioning, very fit physically, but has noticed that over the last six months, he's had difficulty breathing. He saw his primary care physician who referred him to his pulmonologist uh, who diagnosed him to have inter uh, interstitial lung disease, and he was sent to us for further recommendations. The force vital capacity is 53% and uh, diffusion capacity is 42% uh, uh, of predicted. Uh, let's go back to the panel. Um, so. Kaisa, how um, would you approach somebody like this, uh, specifically this person, um, when, when you see him in the clinic? Uh, so what's very striking about this particular case is that it's a, it's a young patient for our typical ILD patients of 39 years old. The other features that are striking are really his, his uh, rapid onset of symptoms within six months suggesting that this could be a more aggressive process that always makes me worry more. And, um, uh, has to speed up the tempo of the investigations and the treatments that we um, that we will be considering for him, and then the severity of his disease. Uh, we have no previous lung function. We don't know what his prior baseline was, but he's now working at you know mid fifties with significant um, impairment in diffusion capacity. So those are the things that are striking. So when I approach that patient, obviously their radiographic uh, imaging will be helpful, but pieces of their history would be what exposures they might have, either be organic exposures, environmental exposures, uh, what he does for a living, what his um, uh, occupation might be, along with his uh, any potential autoimmune symptoms. And I spend a lot of time just looking at their hands, trying to see if I can elicit anything that would suggest an autoimmune disease, as that is something we often see in ILD patients in this age group. Um, and then, of course, familial, so uh, a very careful family history, asking about premature grain, um, family history of interstitial lung disease and pulmonary fibrosis, and then also some of the associated diseases that we sometimes um, see travel with our patients with familial ILD, including cirrhosis and bone marrow dysfunction. Great. Uh, can we go back to the slides, please? Uh, so we did that, um, and, you know, he's 
had some history of smoking. We did not think this was clinically significant, did not have any inhalational or occupational risk factors. Uh, he neither had symptoms uh, nor had signs and detailed serologies were negative. And he did not have any family members with any lung problems or interstitial lung diseases. And so he came to us with a CAT scan. Um, um, and Dr. Lewin, if uh, you would tell us uh, what, what you're seeing on the CAT scan here. Thank you very much. Um, so here we're seeing coronal reformatted as well as uh, transverse axial image at the um, upper lung zones. And I think that when we look at the coronal reformatted image, we can clearly see that there are abnormalities in the lungs that predominate at the lung bases. Looking in more detail, <clears throat> excuse me, at the transverse images, we can certainly appreciate that there is a fibrotic disease in which we see largely subpleural reticular opacities with associated areas of early honeycombing. If I can have the next slide, please. As we continue down the lungs, appreciate along the anterior aspect of both upper lobes, the presence of honeycombing. So clearly a fibrotic lung disease that's, that's very uh, evident along with what I've already described as subpleural reticulation. As our eyes travel down to the more inferior lungs, we can appreciate not only the subpleural predominance of the largely uh, intralobular reticular opacities, we also appreciate areas of ground glass that are away from the subpleural regions. And when we see ground glass away from subpleural regions, despite the lower low predominance of abnormalities, we're certainly thinking that this is not a typical UIP pattern. Um, so, so in this young individual, although there is clearly fibrotic lung disease, it has a significant amounts of associated ground glass. And this would definitely not be typical of a UIP pattern um, as already discussed. Uh, certainly, we would, might think about connective tissue disorders or something familial, given his relatively young age. Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Moon. So, Dr. Mooney, you know, given this, uh, should this patient be biopsied? Uh... Yeah, uh, thanks, Dr. Raj. Uh, you know, I think we're dealing with a young patient. He does have significant, you know, physiologic impairment, but otherwise healthy. And we have an otherwise idiopathic process that is in an atypical or indeterminate pattern for UIP. So I do think in this setting that um, further uh, uh, pathologic uh, sampling could be helpful in providing, and, and providing us a more definitive diagnosis, but also guiding our treatment. Um, in terms of you know, what type of biopsy, I, I would I think probably a surgical lung biopsy would be favorable in terms of the information he provides. Um, I, I think given his uh, state of health, he's probably right at the cusp of someone who could tolerate that. Um, and so I'd probably pursue a surgical lung biopsy in, in this patient. Right, uh, um, can we go back to the slides, uh, please? Uh... So this is... Uh what was done. In fact, his referring physician had made a decision to proceed with surgical lung biopsy, just as you had suggested. Um, and then uh, this is what we found. Dr. Barry, uh, could you please tell us what we're seeing here? Yes. So a, a generous sampling of the left upper and lower lobes were performed. And uh, as demonstrated by this uh, low power magnification, I think there's a variety of different patterns that you can pick out depending on which lobby you you um, you, you uh, evaluate. Some of the areas show a, a marked uh, distortion of the lobules with fibrosis, as noted off to the the far uh, left hand side of the image, while others show better preservation of the lobules. Um, and then I think if we go to the next slide, we can appreciate again this um, variety of patterns. There's some areas where you see subpleural fibrosis with uh, uh, with increased fibrosis and fibroblastic activity towards the periphery of the lobule, uh, suggesting an, a, an early UIP-like pattern. If we go to the next slide, I think we can appreciate other areas that show more of a uniform expansion of the uh, <coughs> of the distortion of the lobule, suggesting almost a fibrotic NSIP-like change. And I think the Next slide showed that there were areas that had progressed to uh, honeycomb change. Also draw your attention to the uh, intense uh, inflammatory 
a component that's present in some of these areas. So again, it's not a, a typical UIP-like pattern, and it would raise uh, a differential that would include, at least based on the morphology, a connective tissue disease-associated um, um, uh, lesion. Uh, but in, overall, it, I, I think it's unclassifiable given these uh, variety of different patterns. Thank you, Dr. Brewer. Could, uh, could we go back to the panel, please? Uh, so, Dr. DeVore, uh, you know, given all this so far, um, what do you, what should we say the patient has? Uh, At this point, I think he remains unclassifiable. Um, he has uh, a CT scan, which is um, inconsistent with the UIP, has areas that we suspect might be inflammatory because there's ground glass away from those areas of fibrosis, and then a mixed pattern on his biopsy. Um, we do see this uh, sort of discordant pat pattern in patients with familial disease. So I think I would go back to my history and go back to testing for that as long with, with a, a very careful screen for rheumatologic diseases, just based on the pattern. But I think we don't have anything per history or per serologies or by clinical findings at this point. And so he, that puts him in this unclassifiable um, ILD. The concern is that there is this element of fibrosis, but there's also some inflammation. So because he's so young and um, um, uh, and he's changed so quickly, I think you, you would often offer him a trial of immunosuppression. And uh, looking at the history, um, which Dr. Rush has provided, so um, when uh, additional history was attained, it looks like he has a history of premature graying in his 20s. Right to the slide, history. I'm sorry, uh, please continue. Yeah. So unclassifiable at this point. Uh, all right, um, great. Uh, so, you know, we did uh, talk to him. There was no family history of interstitial lung disease. And as you mentioned, he did have history of early grain and uh, 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 family history of uh, uh, early grain. Um, let's see if I can have the slides. Um, he, he was started on prednisone by his uh, referring physician. He was started also on mycophenolate, which was escalated. Um, this was continued for about two months, uh, which is when uh, he saw us. He wasn't feeling much better. His uh, force vital capacity and diffusion capacity actually had continued to deteriorate a bit. Uh, I think. So, um, and what do you think about the CAT scan here? It does look uh, quite better, uh, even though he's not feeling much better. So we have um, images at presentation and then two months later corresponding to his uh, treatment. And I think that while the two months later study looks like um, that some of the areas potentially that were darker or, or I'm sorry, lighter on the prior study look better aerated or blacker. In fact, I think that largely the changes that we're seeing are related to the lung volumes. So he is at higher lung volumes on the two month study. And I looked in detail at the uh, images and compared them. And I think in honesty, the areas of subpleural reticulation and ground glass largely remain the same. And I do not believe that I have control to the arrow to show areas of, of, of change. Um, but uh, it, but um, uh, I think on this one, as I've said, the, the images are the same except for a change in lung volumes. Thank you, Anne. So, um, Kaisa, what, uh, given all this information, you know, what, what else should we be doing? What else should we be looking for in this patient? Uh, yeah, I think the, you know, going back to his history, the family history of premature graying and, um, you know, which sounds quite significant, is an important factor to not miss. And so that could be suggestive of short telomeres or telomeropathy. And so that when I hear that from patients, I typically refer them um, for genetic testing. So measuring their telomere lengths along with sending them for a genetic panel. Those typically could involve turf and turf mutations, um, looking for PARN and other, other um, mutations or variants, I should say, that are associated with these diseases. So I would send him for that along with um, the telomere lengths that I mentioned and genetic counseling. Um, and just to alert him of what I'm listening for and looking for so that he could go back to his family history and make sure there isn't anyone um, in that history that we've missed. Regarding uh, his, um, his CT scan, it, it, you know, accounting for differences of technique, you know, that, that does seem concerning that he's not responding to immunosuppression. Um, you know, when we see those mixed patterns on either biopsy or CT scan, we do 
often offer them immunosuppression because we're hopeful that there is something uh, that is reversible and still active. But my concern now without that response and with that uh, reasonable trial that, that we're looking at something that's more fibrotic and likely gonna continue to progress. And so this is what we did, and he was heterozygous for a TERT mutation. And so the interpretation, Kaisa, here is uncertain significance. So what, what do you make of that? Yeah. Well, I think anytime you have um, you know, a documented concerning disease like ILD, family history of premature growing, a personal history, history of premature growing, and then heterozygous for a TERT mutation, I mean, to me, this is significant. Um, and... Uh, and suggest that there is something inherited in this family that predisposes him, one, to the ILD, um, other potential uh, complications, including bone marrow dysfunction. So I go back to his CBC, make sure there's no abnormalities there. As specifically, the MCV is sometimes um, helpful to suggest there could be something along with uh, uh, making sure the LFTs are normal. So it is, it is pertinent. Um, the penetrance can be variable, so that could be why other family members didn't necessarily uh, present. And then what you're showing here is, is the telomere lengths that I requested. So the way this is plotted is that we can see um, various cell populations, the lymphocytes, the granulocytes, and others, um, and they measure their telomere lengths. And in this patient- Can we you can go back that, to the slides, please? Uh, sorry, Kaiser, go ahead. Um, that's okay, so thank you. Um, so you can just see that the patient really has low telomeres. Um, for the most part, it looks like um, in the less than 10% or even 1 percentile range, which is significant um, short. And so the, the concern is that for patients who have these shortened telomeres um, during cell population, um, this leads to premature senescence or apoptosis in those cell lines, which could predispose them to other diseases like ILD. Um, and then treatment-wise, um, what should we what should we what should we change him to, or what should we do for his treatment? Because he didn't respond well to steroids. He is on mycophenolate, fifteen hundred milligrams twice a day, and he's still getting worse. Yeah. Uh, so what I typically do in this scenario is I try to minimize the toxicity of immunosuppression, um, specifically the prednisone. So I would certainly wean him off that, and um, and start also considering weaning the salcept. Um, the other piece to add is that if we have evidence of progression of fibrosis, then antifibrotics would be um, my next uh, treatment plan. And the other piece to that would be very... Um, an early referral to lung transplant for evaluation would be approved. Thank you. Um, um, so the patient continued to deteriorate uh, as you recommended uh, prednisone or mycophenolate were stopped. He was started on entetanib and he was referred to lung transplant. So Josh, uh, you know, who should or should not be referred to lung transplant and what's a good time uh, for, for us to refer these patients to lung transplant? Uh, yeah, so I, I think, you know, in, in, case, in patients with ILD, I think earlier is always more favorable um, as a general rule of thumb. And then, you know, in patients like, like this who presented with more significant disease at presentation or with patients with high um, <clears throat> likelihood of progression um, <clears throat> or patients that have demonstrated progression, all of those patients should be considered for lung transplant referral. I think, you know, in this specific patient, he's a young, otherwise healthy uh, patient with, um, you know, significant fibrotic interstitial lung disease and lung transplant should, should definitely be considered uh, at this course. In terms of his short telomere uh, syndrome or potential sy syndrome, um, this shouldn't be viewed as a contraindication. I think there'll be need for a close assessment of uh, his bone marrow function, his liver function as part of his transplant evaluation. But I think we now have, you know, literature suggesting that these patients can be successfully transplanted if selected appropriately. Um, and if their post-operative management can potentially take account into, into uh, telomere related uh, abnormalities. Thank you, Josh. Uh, 
Um, so he continued to get worse. Uh, he needed more and more oxygen, get, continued to get more and more short of breath. His pulmonary function test also progressed. Uh, um, and what do you see on the CAT scan here? Uh, so what we have here is a series of images uh, taken over a relatively short period with the top left image at five months uh, after presentation and the last image at nine months. And on the, uh, on the one in between at 6.5 months, I'm showing by arrows where we are seeing progression of the extent of the ground glass opacities. And then on uh, the last image at nine months, very extensive ground glass opacities. I think what's notable in this uh, particular situation though, is despite a significant uh, interval increase in extent of ground glass, the degree of reticulation um, is, is uh, fairly pronounced, but the obvious evidence of progressive fibrosis per se, i.e. traction bronchiexis, loss of, uh, loss of volume and honeycombing, we're not seeing that. We're just seeing extensive ground glass opacities in this individual, suggesting there is some phenomena ongoing, some type of inflammatory process like an exacerbation. Uh, and clinically, that is what happened. In fact, uh, uh, just as this CAT scan was done, you know, over the last couple of uh, weeks, he had uh, rather accelerated decline in his uh, effort tolerance, hypoxia, and he went on from not requiring oxygen to two liters to four liters, 10 liters, uh, and, and, and being hypoxic on that. So Susan, when patients are this hypoxic, you know, what are considerations in terms of prescribing oxygen and how does, uh, how does, one, uh, how does one do that? Uh, well, in this patient, you have the advantage that you know he's a rapid progressing patient. So right away, the issue is that um, Clinicians need to understand not providing a, what we call a pulse device, like a portable oxygen concentrator, which are heavily marketed. And those only go to three liters a minute continuous. So for this gentleman, uh, and it's important to know that a setting of six on a POC does not equal a setting of six on a continuous flow device. So unfortunately, this gentleman will be needing a high flow regulator. It can go up to 10 liters on you know, E-tanks, compressed gas. Um, and a high flow stationary concentrator at home. Um, those actually can be too wide together to get over 10 liters if need be. Certainly if there's access to liquid oxygen that can provide this patient portable high flow, but that's pretty uh, rare these days. And just in terms of uh, facilitating this, pulmonary rehab referral is important. They can titrate. And the PFF also actually has an oxygen helpline for patients that they can call and get other information. Thank you, Susan. So he continued to worsen. Uh, he was eventually hospitalized and he received a bilateral lung transplant. Uh, um, uh, Dr. Berry, uh, what, what do we see here? So both lungs actually showed similar findings. One, of course, was reflecting his, uh, his IL, the fibrotic ILD. The, the lungs were, were small and, um, and uh, quite fibrotic, but diffusely consolidated and or, or firm throughout uh, 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 throughout all the uh, all the different lobes, the panel on the the right shows basically what most of the areas of lung look like, which was this consolidated pattern. There are areas where you you can see the honeycomb change, but this was uh, sort of in the minority, reflecting the radiographic changes. Rather, what you see is um, is a mixed cellular and and um, and in, inflammatory or fibroinflammatory process that looks like an organizing phase of uh, diffuse alveolar damage. It's an organizing lung injury pattern without, uh, without an underlying infectious etiology and, and it presumably is related to a, uh, uh, an accelerated phase of his um, underlying ILD. And here, just again, high power magnification, there's still some residual hilum membranes. There's a classic widening of the alveolar septa and, and the reactive uh, lining cells with a very sparse inflammatory infiltrate. So again, it looks like an acute exacerbation on an underlying uh, fibrotic ILD. Thank you, Dr. Berry. So the patient uh, received a bilateral lung transplant and he's done very well one and a half uh, years after transplant. Um, we'll stop here, go back uh, to the panel and then take any audience questions. Uh, so the first uh, audience question is, Danazol has been studied in telomeropathies. Um, is anyone looking at it uh, in slowing associated lung disease? So, um, uh, well, uh, does anybody from the panel want to take this, uh, Josh, Kaisa? So I, um, I have not personally used it for patients um, in this in this setting. 
Um, I know that there are some case reports where it's been used in a um, case report that I'm aware of. It was also used in combination with um, more traditional treatments, including salcept and um, prednisone. Um, with some benefit is that well, you know when we mix treatments, it's often hard to know which is the one that's dominating the effect. But um, um, and and a, a case report is pretty limited for evidence moving forward. And there is a NIH uh, uh, study uh, uh, for danazole in patients with pulmonary fibrosis uh, in telomeropathies. Uh, uh, I've used it on one patient, and I, I don't think it made any difference. So I think the short answer is. Um, Probably not, but it's being studied as we speak. Uh, um, any other questions uh, on these cases so far? No further questions. So we'll go back to uh, slides and let's go on with the case two here. All right. Um, so this patient was a 55-year-old woman who was uh, referred to us for her ILD. She'd been coughing for five years. Uh, some exertional dyspnea. Uh, she worked as a janitor. Uh, diabetes, hypertension, and hypercholesterolemia were the comorbidities. She had no symptoms or previous diagnosis of connective tissue disease. Uh, um, Josh, in somebody like this, uh, you know, we know that exposure history is important, but how, how do you really approach uh, uh, somebody uh, like this uh, in terms of exposure history? Yeah, great question. So, you know, particularly I think in this um, age group, it's really important to look for etiologies of their lung disease. Um, and, you know, as mentioned in the slide, we look for connective tissue disorder, but exposure history, I think, is something that is extremely important and often overlooked. And when I'm looking at um, exposure history, really I'm talking through with a patient uh, what they've done for work, what's in their home environment, what's in their surrounding uh, environment where they live, um, and also what, times, what types of hobbies or, or things that they do on their free time. And so in terms of work, I'm talking about what they've done not just currently, but what they've done in previous years or throughout their lifetime. We often gather, you know, pretty much every job that they have and what they were exposed to, if anything, during those jobs. Um, in terms of the, the home, we're asking, uh, you know, in, in, uh, specifically for any bird exposures. Um, I find that you usually have to ask a couple different ways about birds. Um, and so birds, you know, now and in the past, um, any bird feather products, so any down products within the home um, environment, I think is really important. Um, we see a number of patients that are, live in agricultural rich areas, maybe they're exposed to almond or walnut uh, dust or other exposures within not necessarily within their home, but within the air that they breathe on a regular basis. And so their place of living and, and what's surrounding their home is oftentimes important. Um, and then hobbies, you know, what do they like to do uh, on their free time? Sometimes you can um, gather um, exposures through that. We also, you know, in, in my practice, uh, particularly if there's a high uh, suspicion um, but really in most patients, you know, we'll also provide them with a questionnaire to take home to look within their home environment at any possible exposures. Okay, great. And so we talked to her, she did live on a farm, uh, which houses hogs, cows, and chicken. Uh, she did take care of all these animals directly, and she also had a dove in her home, uh, and she's had the bird for five, uh, two to three years. Uh, and this is what her CAT scan uh, looked like. And what do you see on the CAT scan here? Uh, so we have images um, pretty high up at the level of the aortic arch and then in the lung bases. And I think that what we can appreciate is when we compare the attenuation of the lung parenchyma to the, uh, to the airway, the trachea, it's pretty evident that the lung attenuation is higher than, than is normal uh, as it should approach the density of the airway. So the abnormalities are very extensive, both in the um, upper as well as the uh, lower lung zones. And if we go to the next image, please, thank you. Uh, 
Um, I'm showing you an expiratory image of the uh, right lung on the left and the inspiratory image on the right. And what you can appreciate is are these lobules of darkness. And if we, you click the arrow, you, the, the yellow arrows will come up to show the areas, these lobular uh, areas of air trapping. So now we see uh, diffuse ground glass in the lung that represents the parenchymal infiltration as well as a finding of small airways disease, i.e. the air trapping. And those two criteria allow us uh, to, uh, for us to suspect that this might be an inhalational disorder like hypersensitivity pneumonitis. It fulfills those ATS criteria for hypersensitivity pneumonitis. In a different context, if the patient, for example, was a smoker, we might consider other entities such as smoking-related disorders. But, um, but in a non-smoker, for example, this, these findings would be highly suspicious for non-fibrotic hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Thank you, Anne. That was very helpful. Um, um, so her PFT showed a forced vital capacity of 60%, diffusion capacity of 35%. Uh, she did not have any obstruction on her PFTs, and she desaturated on 82 percent. Uh, so, Susan, uh, with with this desaturation, you know, what what should we be doing next when uh, when we have somebody like this? Uh, so, this is a patient, uh, unlike our first patient, who we don't really know how fast he's going to progress. And um, according to our clinical guidelines, uh, patients who only have exertion only uh, hypoxemia, you know, is a conditional recommendation. So it had very weak evidence. There weren't a lot of studies looking at this in ILD patients. So some patients may choose to use it and some may not is how we would define a conditional recommendation. Uh, so for her, she would uh, be considered, you know, factors like how is she working all day? Is this woman exposed to low oxygen levels much of her day? Um, does she desaturate at night? She would need to get overnight oximetry. Does she have any signs of cardiac, you know, right heart failure, pulmonary hypertension? Those would all go into factoring her recommendation. She could probably use a, a portable oxygen concentrator to begin with. Again, having deep instruction on being retested and monitored and as if her, if her condition changes. Um, and, and the fact that for her, she may be a small woman who can't lift an e-tank in and out of a car. So that needs to be documented in her notes. So, you know, she could be prescribed a POC a um, stationary concentrator at home and, and, and monitored, but she could possibly get away with, you know, depending on our titration, um, a POC for her. Thank you, Susan. So Josh, uh, you know, given the information we have, you know, the CAT scan that seemed pretty difficult, she had some exposures. Do we, uh, do we need to do any invasive procedures? And if yes, you know, what are the options and pros and cons of various procedures at this time? Yeah, so I, we have, um, you know, relatively recent guidelines from ATS on the diagnosis of HP, which I think brings more guidance in terms of how we think about, you know, a probable or provisional diagnosis or a more definite diagnosis. In this patient, like you mentioned, I think we have a compatible antigen exposure. We have a typical HRCT pattern. And so that already puts us into... Um, kind of a moderate confidence diagnosis. You know, according to the more recent guidelines, if we were to do a BAL and um, with um, lymphocytosis, that would increase our level of confidence and um, corresponding histopathology would, would further uh, increase it. And so I think in this setting, um, you know, it, uh, a Bronchoscopy with at least BAL looking for lymphocytosis would be reasonable, I think, particularly given that this seems like a more active or an acute setting. Um, and then I would consider uh, doing a transbronchial biopsy or potentially a cryobiopsy, depending on the center's experience. Um, recognizing that with her DLCO, you know, you have to, um, uh, you know, biopsy may put her at a slightly higher risk. And I don't think that a surgical lung biopsy would be necessary nor indicated. Um, so, um, Dr. Berry, I had a question for you. Uh, you know, if, although uh, transbronchial cryobiopsies are relatively safe, but they are still associated with a high risk of pneumothorax or bleeding when compared to transbronchial forceps biopsies, 
from a pathologist perspective, does it does it really matter, or do cryobiopsies really add much to forceps biopsies? I think it, it's going to depend on a variety of things. One, of course, is the extent of the disease, um, and and I think, in, as Josh mentioned, I think having center experience is particularly important in evaluating uh, the 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 cryobiopsies as, as demonstrated here. These are sort of uh, two petri dishes uh, side by side, comparing just the size of the uh, traditional forceps transbronchial biopsy uh, on the uh, on the right compared to the cryobiopsy, and so the the sample sizes are are are, are uh, quite impressively large. Um, and there's a couple of other things that are very helpful about the cryobiopsy. Um, for example, the the uh, based on the on the procedure itself and the technique, the um, Air spaces remain nicely patent as opposed to the typical atelectasis that you see in a traditional transbronchial biopsy. The, the, uh, some of the other artifacts, uh, such as hemorrhage, that uh, often accompany transbronchial biopsies are limited or often absent in a, in a good cryobiopsy. There are some inherent artifacts that one has to be aware of with the cryobiopsy in their evaluation, but I, I, I think that um, uh, I certainly, just based on the on the you know fifteen fold increase in in material to look at, I I I I, uh, I find them very uh, 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 I I I recommend them from a pathologist perspective, just based on on uh, tissue size. And so I think you provided us with some examples uh, comparing uh, these uh, two. Yeah, so these are, again, the traditional uh, uh, fiber optic transbronchial biopsy. These are taken at the same magnification, which just gives you sort of the, an overall gestalt about the, the tremendous volume of material that one has to look at. I think this one also uh, nicely demonstrates just the difference in the, in the uh, expansion of the air spaces, which then allows you to evaluate um, the interstitium uh, uh, perhaps a little more selectively and, and a little more confidently. Again, here's higher magnification, just showing the, the usual collapse and, and uh, hemorrhage that associates with a, a, a transbronchial biopsy versus the cryobiopsy on the, uh, uh, on the left. So there are certain tremendous in interpretive advantages of the, uh, of the cryobiopsy. And so this patient actually had a transbronchial forceps biopsy. Um, Trey, what do you see here uh, yeah. on this slide? Yes, yeah, so, so you just sort of a, a very high power magnification, but you can appreciate this small airway within the wall of which is a, is a portiform granuloma. It's associated with a limited um, amount of interstitial pneumonitis. Um, so certainly seeing that pattern um, raises the, uh, the, the differential diagnosis and, and places hypersensitivity very high on, uh, on the differential diagnostic considerations. Thank you, Jerry. So Josh, uh, this is what her BL differential showed, uh, 70% lymphocytes, 5% eosinophils, and infectious studies were negative. Does that help us uh, one way or the other? Or? Yeah, I, I think, you know, based e even without the pathology, but, you know, in the setting of her exposure history, her CT scan, and then, you know, supporting really lymphocytic predominance, and it's, you know, not in that questionable 20%, you know, range, but it's really predominant at 70%. I think that's, you know, very supportive of a high confident diagnosis of HP. I think it's also, you know, likely supportive that this is still a more active, um, you know, a, a subacute type of uh, disease with um, active lymphocytic inflammation. Um. Trying to advance slides here. So she was started on prednisone 60 milligrams, which was tapered over two months. She was asked to get rid of the bird. Uh, um, she was asked to avoid organic uh, dust inhalational exposures. Josh, does that sound like a reasonable approach here? Yeah, I think based on it, you know the the imaging and and findings to date, I think um, a trial of of uh, prednisone while assessing for really objective res response to that would be reasonable. And most importantly, I think antigen abatement, uh, so removal of the bird is, um, is key to really having success. Right. And so she came two months later, she felt that she was feeling back to baseline. She was thinking about getting rid of the bird. Uh, other exposures uh, continue, her force vital capacity increased um, and her desaturation uh, had actually disappeared. So at this point, uh, uh, Treatment-wise, Josh, uh, should we continue the steroids? Should we change it to something else, or what would you do at this point? Uh, yeah, well, it's 
I think we see here that she's objectively and subjectively responded to treatment, uh, suggesting a steroid responsive uh, disease process. I, uh, um, I think you know, there's a couple of factors that raise con concern for potential relapse, including that she still has ongoing exposure. Um, and so given her response and ongoing exposure and the risks uh, associated with prolonged prednisone treatment, I would at this point um, pursue a steroid sparing agent such as mycophenolate. There's at least respect, retrospective information uh, uh, to support their use. And what I usually do is, you know, we'll use this for a course of 12, 18, 24 months with close follow-up in terms of uh, assessing whether to continue, for how long to continue that type of treatment. So she actually declined treatment uh, and she came back after 13 months. She was feeling worse. PFTs were worse. Um, she was not using oxygen. Um, she was not taking care of chicken and farms, but now she had an additional bird uh, um, and then we had a CAT scan. Um, Ann, could you please tell us what we see on the CAT scan here? So for the um, for the thirteen month CT scan, I think that we can appreciate early findings of fibrosis. And if we look at the airway in the left upper lobe, um, perhaps we can show the irregular walls that is telling us that there is architectural distortion in that region. So still has ground glass opacities in the lungs uh, and now with developing findings of fibrotic lung disease. Thank you. So uh, Drush, given this, uh, would antifibrotic medications be a consideration? And what other treatment recommendations would you have for her at this time? Yeah, I think this is a, a little trickier uh, spot. I think we do have you know, from the inbuilt trial with progressive fibrotic ILD, some evidence to support the use of antifibrotics. So I think it could be considered here or I would, or with close follow-up. I would think that based on the, the current uh, spot that there may be some response um, uh, even to retrial of prednisone, uh, given that she has active bird exposure and some ground glass. And so I, I think similar to her initial presentation, probably a short course of prednisone as well to assess for improvement with the thought of, uh, you know, low threshold for adding antifibrotic uh, treatment. Thank you, Josh. So she still didn't want any treatments because she thought she felt better. She didn't come for a follow-up five years later. She has no more exposures. Uh, she's a little hypoxic, you know, these adds to 88% uh, on walking. And this is what her CAT scan showed. And uh, what do you see on the CAT scan here? So unfortunately, at a five years time, we're seeing uh, more evidence of fibrotic lung disease with greater architectural distortion and these band-like opacities. Notice now that in the background of her lung, her uh, ground glass has largely uh, resolved, although the residual areas with architectural distortion are now fibrotic lung disease. And this slide here. And then the coronal reformatted image just shows the peribronchovascular distribution and upper lobe predominance of the fibrotic lung disease. So we're out of time. So uh, we'll stop here. Uh, and we have one question from the audience. Uh, is there any evidence to correlate BL findings to help differentiate this from small airway disease versus HP? Um, does anybody from the audience, uh, uh, anybody from the panel uh, want to take this, uh, Josh? Uh, yeah, I, um, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, in this setting with high lymphocytic predominance, it's something I wouldn't be as suspect as highly in other small airway disorders like COPD or asthma. And so I think, um, you know, I think the clinical history and, and also some of the other radiographic features beyond small airway disease is helpful, but the lymphocytic predominance, I think, would also point me towards HP. Great. All right. Uh, thank you, everyone on the panel. We're out of time, and we'll stop here. Uh, thank you, everyone. We'd like to close by thanking the multidisciplinary team from Stanford University and the rest of our speakers for sharing their expertise in these outstanding lectures.
thanks to the PFF and uh, for all the great tech support we received as well. And thanks to all of you for attending and participating. We hope you return tomorrow at noon for part two. Thank you.